Over the course of the last year, we've been covering everything that's going to be in this season of My Hero Academia Season 7, which includes all of the events of the Final War arc, pretty much every battle between the villains and the heroes. And now in this video, I've put all of that together to pretty much give you the full story of My Hero Academia Season 7. So this video includes every single battle, every single moment, with the exception of the two very final battles of the series, All Might vs. All for One and Deku vs. Shigaraki, which I am going to be covering in their own video video together like this as the final battle of My Hero Academia, but for now, catch up on everything that's going to happen in My Hero Academia Season 7 with the full story starting now. Shigaraki has had a long year already in My Hero Academia with the events of both war arcs in the manga and in the anime. But this time, we're going to be discussing the day that Shigaraki met America's number one hero, otherwise known as one of the strongest heroes in the entire world of the series. But to go over this story, we actually have to go a little back in time to All Might's time in the States. Because this story actually starts with a crew of villains who it seems like recently robbed a bank or something, but they rush down the city streets as we see a young All Might with David Shield in what seems to be like the All Might mobile because it has space for both of them. And All Might jumps off the car making it go kind of swerving out of control as he jumps into the air using just the sheer power of his limbs to more or less fly up in the air and punch away all the missiles that this villain who is now jumping off of buildings has for All Might. Now more of the missiles head towards All Might as he punches them too and ends up kind of going through the large fire explosion that they cause and that reveals his hero suit at the time which is definitely different than the one that we see later on on in the series as All Might continues to punch the villain into submission, sending the villain falling down off a Detroit smash into the ground down below in the city that kind of looks like New York at least to a certain extent. Now All Might doesn't initially start this battle alone because we see when the villains initially break out of the casino that they were robbing, other heroes do end up responding to keep the villain from taking the 10 million dollars, but it's really only All Might that's capable of making a difference. And as the villain is trying to get away and jumping over buildings and cop cars and any hero that gets in his way, he nearly lands on a car holding a young family before All Might lands right in front of him just in the nick of time and sends him flying with an amazing punch. Now this is where we get the amazing shot of All Might standing in front of the fire with his jacket kind of flowing in the wind and I still really really want that jacket. Someone let me know where I could find that jacket. But little did we know at that time that we were seeing the birth of a hero. And that's because after the events of My Hero Academia's war arc, we do see a large scale prison break operation led by All For One where various characters like Stain, Muscular, and Overhaul do end up escaping prison and getting back out onto the Japanese streets. And you can watch my video about that by clicking the card in the top right where I go over the whole Tartarus incident report hour by hour discussing how all of that went down. But you can imagine that having all these different villains escaping all these different prisons eventually ended up leaving Japan in a very, very soft state. Now, in an attempt to kind of come and help Japan because no one else seemed like they were trying to, we have America's number one hero, Kathleen Bate, otherwise known as Star and Stripe, standing on top of a stealth bomber as they make their way at top speed towards Japan. But this is where elsewhere, we see All For One starting the monologue about his final grand plan and detailing where exactly things are in those plans. All For One says that he's laid out plans that span lifetimes. And now, as we wind down the clock on this grand plan, we are approached by our greatest hurdle and our greatest opportunity. Spinner seems to wonder what All For One means by greatest hurdle and greatest opportunity, and that's where All For One replies, Star and Stripes, the world's strongest woman. She hails from the home of the heroes, the land of the free, and sits at the zenith of heroes all around the world. Underhanded tricks won't work on her. If someone like her were to intervene, there's no doubt we would be in trouble. But if I were to get my hands on her quirk, well, the rest is history, as they'd say. And that's where we see Hawks and Best Genus driving down the highway near what seems to be the ocean, as we see Endeavor in the sky also flying near them because they're all coordinating a way to meet Star and Stripes as she heads over to America. With Hawks telling us it seems like she's going to be entering our airspace shortly, so as soon as she gets here, we'll be able to meet her and kind of set up some countermeasures for All for One and all the stuff that's going on. But it's then when they get a report from Sue Couchy that something is wrong. I just received word that there's something else in the airspace around 50 kilometers away from their planned landing spot. It's him. 
He's arrived! And as the camera rushes towards the ocean and the sky beyond, we see a figure floating in the air, waiting for Star and Stripes and her battalion of stealth bombers, covered in a dark and tattered cloak with his hair longer than we've ever seen before flowing in the wind. It's Shigaraki, now healed from the events of My Hero Academia's war arc. And Shigaraki pulls up Hero for all new fit, with Shigaraki actually wearing what seems to be like a suit, very much reminiscent of All for One, but he also does have his big ragged cloak, which I wonder if that's his costume from the My Villain Academia arc, now just sort of wrapped around him in a cool way. And of course, this is meant to signify the fusion between All for One and Shigaraki, which is now more complete than it's ever been, with Shigaraki, of course, wearing a very All for One style suit and still having part of his outfit being the other half of the outfit so he can maintain his identity. But Star and Stripe kind of finds it funny that someone made it all the way up here to greet her and she goes, you must be one free guy to come up all this way up here to greet me. But Shigaraki just stares her down with a deadpan expression, not saying anything. As Star and Stripe realizes, are you the villain they call all for one? And Shigaraki responds, well, who am I indeed? We see one of Star's pilots say negative Star, that's Shigaraki Tamora, and it seems like he can use EMP blasts, so all units need to deploy their force fields right now, and everyone needs to turn off autopilot just in case he EMPs us, you have to be in control of your ship. And that's when Star says that there's only one option left here, and that's to smash their way through. So all the jets take a formation of Star still standing on front of one of them, as she says it's time to exterminate a villain. And she promises her crew that if any of them don't make it, she'll at least make sure that their body gets back to their families with no man getting left behind. But at the same time, on the other side of the battlefield in the sky, Shigaraki has a strange conversation with himself. He goes, what is this weird sensation? I know for a fact that I'm Shigaraki Tamora, but at the same time, I'm undoubtedly myself too, kind of playing off that weird battle of the wits between Shigaraki and All for One for this body. And here we see a weird situation where now it seems like their conscious this has fused so much that whoever the main personality is really can't differentiate between who's in control, right? It seems like a true proper fusion between both personalities has taken its effect here. And that's really, really not good for Star and Stripe because that kind of means that Shigaraki has all the knowledge of how to use the quirks that are in All for One, whereas before he didn't really quite understand how to use all of them to their best effect. And we ended up seeing All for One have to take over to use them in better ways to get advantages over on the heroes in the war arc. Shigaraki uses three quirks together, which are radio waves, push, and load up. And as Star screams for everyone to dodge, we see a massive burst of like energy coming from Shigaraki's hand, sort of like a Kamehameha wave, just absolutely devastating a large area above the clouds. And we even see a large section of the clouds getting pushed back from this attack. And as the battle truly begins, we see Shigaraki being arrogant and joking around of Star and Stripes, going, who do you think's gonna get the first touch in, Miss America? But Star and Stripes responds and says, even if I knew what other hidden abilities you have in store for me, I have no need to prepare for them because that's what it means to truly be the strongest. And at this point, Star and Stripe begins to use her quirk, New Order. And let me tell you, this is, I guess, besides all for one and one for all, and even maybe more so than both those quirks, the most broken quirk that we've seen in the world of My Hero Academia. And here's how we see it used for the first time. Star lets some air slip through her fingers as her hand is in front of her, and as she grips it, she says, says atmosphere. From here to 100 meters in front of me, the atmosphere will cease to exist. And this pretty much creates a 100 meter zone of harsh space-like conditions, meaning Shigaraki has no way of breathing or anything in this large area between him and Star and Stripe. And that's just the scary nature of her quirk, right? Star and Stripes is able to touch something or grab something and imply a rule on it as long as she knows its name. So by touching the air in the atmosphere, she was able to use a rule to completely just make the air within a certain distance go away. And as Shigaraki gasps for air, trying to get a hold of himself as his eyes start popping and all sorts of madness occurs with his body, he says, what a horrifying quirk. I want it. As he's pelted from every direction by various different lasers. But the issue is, Shigaraki here again does have a good handle of the usage of All for One, so he's able to use the reflection and refraction quirks to send these lasers flying back at Star and Stripe and all the jets nearby. Now, having a really, really quick reaction speed, Star and Stripe actually makes contact with the laser as it's hitting her and imposes a rule on the laser, screaming out, Laser, I can hold lasers. And she starts pretty much catching the laser like it's a 
rubber beams. Just showing, again, that Star and Stripe is just massively, massively powerful because this is a very creative quirk. Now, the second that Star and Stripe uses her rule on the laser, the giant vacuum area actually comes undone, and Shigaraki uses the spring-like limbs quirk as well as his All Might level power to jettison himself towards Star and Stripe like we saw All Might doing in that first scene in the video. Now, as Shigaraki rockets himself towards Star and Stripe, she actually launches herself off the jet that she's on top of and punches Shigaraki square in the face, kind of catching him midair and sends him flying. And that's where she begins to activate the conditions of her quirk since now she's made contact of Shigaraki. So she screams out Shigaraki Tamora. If Shigaraki Tamora were to move even an inch from this point onwards, his heart will stop. And it's here where we learn more about the tie between Star and Stripe and All Might. She says, a long time ago, I was saved by a Japanese exchange student while I was with my family near Santa Monica Pier. A runaway villain attacked us in our car, and as I welcomed death, I had only one thought left someone at least saved my sister. That's when the events at the beginning of the video took place, and of course, All Might ended up saving Star and Stripe. And we know because of this situation, Star and Stripe more or less considered All Might to be her spiritual master, or I guess not really her master, because it's not like he taught her how to use her quirk or her abilities, but she just pretty much looked at him like her master in spirit. But as Shigaraki listens to this, he realizes, oh no, I'm caught. She has me now. But in that moment, something very unexpected started to happen. Shigaraki Shigaraki's hair would actually start to grow really, really fast and rapidly as he coughed up blood and started to scream. And then we saw a large explosion of electricity and energy occurring, sending Star and Stripe flying backwards. And as Star and Stripe gets thrown back, very confused, wondering what's going on with Shigaraki and the fact that his hair grew, Shigaraki actually stands up, going, now I get how New Order works. It may be a really supreme quirk, but it's still constrained by rules of its own. And this is where we realize that Star is actually in a very tough situation here because yes normally that would have worked on Shigaraki since he is Shigaraki Tamora but the issue is since Star and Stripe hasn't made it to All Might she doesn't really have the information that Shigaraki is actually named Tenko Shimura that is actually not his name and even beside that we also have the situation going on of Shigaraki's true personality melding of All for One so even he doesn't really know whether or not he's Shigaraki Tamora All for One or Tenko Shimura right right now in his mind. This makes it so Star and Stripe's quirk doesn't actually work on Shigaraki, and she's not gonna be able to just get an easy win here by making contact with him and just ending the fight that way. She's actually gonna have to fight him into submission. But Star and Stripe really doesn't understand what's going on, right? And in her head, she thinks that maybe he just has some way to get around attacks that hamper his breathing because he survived the big vacuum attack and he survived her order constricting his breathing. And that's when we see that Star and Stripe feels like the situation has actually gotten very dire, so she puts in a call to the commander to have him send missiles from America all the way over to Japan to try to hit Shigaraki with those, because she feels like at this point, Shigaraki has graduated from just being Japan's threat, and now, since he's putting up such a fight against her, he's kind of a threat against the entire world. And this is where we see this battle truly escalate to a level that we've never seen in My Hero Academia before. Because as Shigaraki lands on his flying high end Nomo and starts making his way towards Star and Stripe, she grabs the atmosphere sphere again and says the air forms into my shape but a thousand times bigger and we see a massive giant star and stripe made out of air standing through the clouds above the ocean getting ready to attack Shigaraki and Shigaraki says that even though nothing is visible in front of him because it's not like Shigaraki can see the giant shape of star and stripe made out of air he can tell something dangerous is coming and we see the giant air star and stripe punching Shigaraki at full speed like a regular Star and Stripe punch as she kind of puppets the giant with her actual body. And this is where Star and Stripe's tactic has completely changed because she realizes, hey, I'm taking too much damage in this fight against this guy and that's kind of pointless. And he's not going to tell me his name, right? I'm not going to be able to figure that out in this battle. So all I can do now is just use my quirk in the most oppressive way that I possibly can to just break this guy down to atoms so he can't regen anymore. It's at this point where she lets out a massive sonic clap, kind of taking a page out of Hulk's book. And as the large 
large giant does the same, we see a massive air beam just kind of hitting Shigaraki as all the clouds around him over the ocean are completely blown away at the impact of force, hitting his body and making him ragged. But Shigaraki's body doesn't completely fall apart yet as he continues to get sent flying through the ocean. But Star and Stripe seeing this and realizes that she needs even more juice, call for all the jets to hit her with their lasers as she says the lasers all combine into one and we see the giant air version of Star and Stripe grab the lasers like a giant lightning bolt from Zeus and pierce it down like a staff or a javelin straight into Shigaraki, straight through the earth and into the ocean. And we see Shigaraki just slowly getting evaporated with the strength of this laser beam. But Star says, even this is not gonna be enough because if this was enough, then Endeavor should have been able to finish the job, right? His firepower is stronger or at least comparable to the power of these lasers and the power of this attack. And this is actually where we start to see that the state-of-the-art hypersonic intercontinental cruise missiles are actually on the way and they're named Tiamat, which is ironically one of the characters from Horikoshi's last manga, Barrage. So I really, really like to see that those were worked into the story here. And this is where we start to get more backstory on the hero. We see that in what seems to be some sort of military training with the rest of her jet squad, she does have some cuts and bruises, and she seems a little angry at the fact that it seems like she lost the combat against her fellow teammate. And this is where Star tells us that at a glance, her quirk seems to be capable of anything, but there was always a hard limit when it came to powering herself up. No matter what sort of rule she tried, it never worked out right. So at this stage in her life, despite the fact that she can make herself way stronger with her quirk, it's not enough to make her so strong that she's just head and shoulders dominant over other people. But her jet fighters say, hey, even when your quirk isn't enough for you to do things on your own, no worries. Just rely on us and we'll always be there for you so we can get everything done together. They say that it's got nothing to do with her being a girl and that's just how her quirk is, but she's really the only person capable of catching up to All Might because they're both beasts. And it's here where Star and Stripe smiles because she knows at the very least, she never heard the words, you're just a girl, that's just how it is, from her fellow teammates. Now back in real time, we see that the giant version of Star and Stripe is still holding down the laser beam on Shigaraki, but Shigaraki thinks that she must know that this isn't doing all that much to me. This United Laser Blast is only meant to stun lock me via relentless damage, all of which tells me she realizes that without a single attack powerful enough to vaporize me, that this is pointless. So she has to be waiting for something that packs an even bigger punch than this. But as Shigaraki continues to evaporate and regen at the same time, Star and Stripe's plan comes to fruition. With the intercontinental missiles finally making it to their destination, Star and Stripe has to use a rule on the missiles to grab them, but at the same time when she does that, that's going to mean that she has to take the rules off of the laser beams that are holding down Shigaraki. So in that moment, she catches all the different missiles coming her way with the giant Star and Stripe Guardian, and all the different jets fire, shooting their lasers downwards towards Shigaraki, who shoots out of the water like a bat out of hell trying to make his way to star and stripes but he ends up actually getting rebuffed by all these different lasers now in that moment star and stripes grabs all the different missiles and uses the rule on them saying that they are redirected and actually spins them using the giant star and stripes guardian punching them into the ground all at once at shigaraki using state-of-the-art hypersonic intercontinental cruise missile punch as we see a massive and i mean massive explosion over the ocean of japan that completely clears the skies and makes a giant circle of clouds around the area big enough for even endeavor to see it off the shore but in this large sparking fiery crater in the center of the ocean which is now just completely blown away right we have the ocean kind of struggling to fill in this space which was burned away from these missiles we see a small hole in the the ground and it seems like coming out of it is Shigaraki who somehow survived this missile attack even though almost all of his flesh is coming off. And that's when everyone realizes that what came out of the ocean flying like a bat out of hell actually wasn't Shigaraki. It was the flying high-end Nomu that actually ended up getting hit by most of the lasers and the large explosion from Star and Stripe. So Shigaraki commands the high-end Nomu to burst and it explodes, causing widespread disarray in Star and Stripe's formation as Shigaraki jumps and darts from plane to plane jumping towards Star and Stripe. And as she floats in the air with her large air guardian, being able to actually take Shigaraki 
Todoroki out using the Guardian and squish the giant jet that he's standing on, she thinks of her friends and realizes that she's not going to take them out just to take out this villain and that it likely wouldn't have done anything in the first place. So Star doesn't end up doing her last attack and we see that sadly, Shigaraki reaches her and puts his hand on her face. And as Shigaraki's hand lands on Star and Stripe's face, he pulls away, pulling her quirk out of her body. But as he pulls his hand away, it seems like Shigaraki used decay on Star and Stripe at the same time that he was stealing her quirk. But in her last moments of having her quirk, she says, I, Kathleen Bate, will not decay, in a kind of desperate effort to keep herself from decaying away as her quirk is stolen. And this is where Shigaraki calls Star and Stripe an idiot because he was able to steal her quirk by pretty much decaying her and absorbing her quirk at the same time, meaning that she had to choose which one she was gonna protect. And by protecting her body using her quirk, she ended up losing her quirk and now has to suffer being decayed as well. And it's at this moment where Shigaraki readies a never before seen fire quirk. It looks like he's actually about to use like flash fire fist or something. And he says, new order, the atmosphere shall, but it seems like he gets cut off by something going on inside, but I bet he was gonna make the atmosphere flammable between him and Star and Stripe and then burn it using his quirk, doing something just amazingly powerful. It probably would have been a massive explosion, but thankfully something ends up going wrong here because the fight is not over. Inside of the Vestige world, we actually see a completely healed Star and Stripe staring down Shigaraki as he walks up all for one and his body fusing together. And outside of the Vestige world, we see Shigaraki's body kind of blowed up in a nasty and disgusting way as it then starts to explode all around. And all over him, Tamora's body begins to break apart as he realizes my quirks are rupturing inside me. And this is where we learn that Star actually set up a trap beforehand just in case her quirk was taken by all for one, saying that New Order will revolt against the other quirks inside of All For One. And that's where Shigaraki, or I guess All For One, is in a very, very unprecedented situation, right? Because all of All For One's life, he's only know that quirks are given and taken, but they're never destroyed. So this is kind of unseen and ridiculous, and it's an impossible situation only possible by the interaction of these very specific characters. Now, Shigaraki tries to give New Order away to one of the pilots, but they all laser him down, and he's actually not really able to respond to this, to the point where now the lasers are actually starting to do damage to Shigaraki and he's actually in a lot of trouble. It's then when we see Star and Stripe finally decaying away, thinking about the time that All Might saved her and watching her jets kind of finish the battle against Shigaraki. And at this point with his body falling apart, Shigaraki calls on the quirk of the high-end Nomo that he was flying with earlier that he stole before and starts flying away towards Japan as Star and Stripe inside of his body starts ripping him and All for One apart from each other and all the different quirks that they have. Have. Now Shigaraki crash lands into the house of two random villains and as Shigaraki puts his hand on this guy's face trying to give him new order so he can have a break and figure out what to do here, he realizes that new order is actually gone because it seems like from fighting all the different quirks that are inside all for one they managed to eventually destroy the quirk new order that was kind of like a virus inside of shigaraki before all of his quirks were deleted but this makes it so that shigaraki yes he did win against star and stripe and end up taking her out but he didn't end up getting the one thing that he wanted the most from the situation which was the quirk and he ended up actually losing some of his quirks to this battle with star and stripe saying that as long as people are still willing to help each other the will of a hero will be passed on and someone will definitely arrive to to take down All For One and put an end to Shigaraki. And inside of Shigaraki, we see a really, really angry All For One, like a, a very furious All For One saying, get out of my body, you corpse, as the star and stripe within All For One starts to fade away. But we see deeper inside, Tenko Shimura is still in there, very much like how Deku saw him, but he's being covered and constricted by hands, struggling to make his way out of the Shigaraki and All For One personality. Now, this battle wasn't for nothing because eventually we would get the data from the battle between Star and Stripes that was recorded on the jets that she was fighting with, given over to the heroes and All Might for the final battle. And this also gave the heroes more time to prepare because they were supposed to fight Shigaraki the day after this happened. But because of the damage that happened to his body from the Star and Stripe fight, they ended up delaying the events of the final war by at least another week, which was the final time extension that the heroes got leading up to that final battle. 
The aftermath of Star and Stripes vs. Shigaraki was very harsh on the rest of the world, and as the sun fell towards the ocean to bring the day to a close, every side took a look at what they'd lost and what still remained for the days still to come. First, a search party consisting of Star and Stripes Jet Force who survived was sent out to try and locate Shigaraki after the battle. However, no trace of him was found besides the damage he did to a small home trying to dump New Order's quirk away. Very quickly after these events, news of Star's defeat and death would spread through the world like wildfire, shocking all those who knew her as the world's strongest hero and pouring ice cold water onto any burning hearts that were willing to fight for Japan. One by one, every nation began to fall to the ground in the face of this massive conflict building up in Japan. And with their own issues mounting at home, this event caused every country to withdraw their forces that were heading to Japan to help against the villains, causing the story to move into a territory where more than ever before, Japan is completely on its own and the heroes that they have are the only ones that they're going to get. This wasn't just a coincidence. This is something that All For One knew would happen if he managed to defeat Star and Stripe. And to take advantage of that, the evil Underlord gave orders to his partners around the world to begin moving and sowing chaos in their respective regions, all to further distract those local governments from being able to lend heroes or any sort of aid to Japan before All For One can claim Deku's quirk for himself. Instead of returning to America, Star's crew completes her mission of reaching All Might and Deku in her place. And thankfully they did because Star's crew was able to log crucial data from the battle between Shigaraki and Star using their onboard devices in their jets, paired with a fully detailed recording of the battle that the heroes can now study to see how Shigaraki has grown and changed as his body has become more accustomed to the all-for-one personality fusion. Lastly, we learned that because of Star and Stripe's brutal battle with the villain, his body, which was originally due to be finished in just three days after Deku's return to UA at the end of the Vigilante Deku arc, was now delayed for another entire week, which buys the hero's crucial time to prepare for all Might tells the students that all out war with All For One and his forces is unavoidable and that they've lost more than half of the heroes they had in the last war. So everyone heading into the next one has to be stronger to pick up the slack. And it's here that we learn that the students all immediately started training after the end of the last battle to be able to fight alongside Midoriya to the end so he doesn't need to be alone in his battle against Shigaraki. So they've all got tricks up their sleeve ready to go. Within the villain's base, we see All For One sitting in a throne as Shigaraki writhes in pain and his mind fractures further and further. As Shiggy screams about hating All Might and bringing him and everyone who remembers him to their end, we see Dobby talk about how he's done listening to All For One or sticking around for this circus act because he just can't stand seeing Endeavor flying around all righteously in pursuit of those who took down Star when he himself is such a bad person. This is where All For One speaks directly to Toya, saying that there's a difference between you and me, even though we are actually very similar. You have big plans, but not many options on how to reach your goal. Whereas I make plans over decades that all eventually reach the same goal. So no matter what happens, I have a way to get what I want, even if people think they've cut off my options. There's always going to be another option. As All For One says this, he tells Dobby that he's going to be leaving Shigaraki with him while he heads out to get something done. And it's then that he tells Toya another difference between him and All For One, which is that All For One has a lot of friends in a lot of places. And right now, the place where he has a friend that matters the most is Yue Hai, where we cut to to see as Toru Hagakure is standing hiding behind a tree or a wall with her hands up looking very, very suspicious. However, although this is where the chapter for that week ended, this was just a red herring to mislead the fans one last time before revealing the true identity of the traitor. We see all of our UA students training with each other as Bakugo tries to catch Deku at full speed, and on the side we see Shoto as he tries to perfect the fusion between both sides of his body using heat and ice together to create the technique that he uses later on in his battle against Toya, which we've already covered in full on this channel in the story series. Sorry again that we don't necessarily do them in order. I kind of do them in the order that I want to. But you can go check out the video about Shoto and Dobby's last fight in the card in the top right. Kaminari mentions that the villains are actually super nerfed right now, with Shigaraki's body out of the picture for a while, Makia completely knocked out, and All For One himself is only wielding a copy of the original quirk. Bakugo and Momo come together to remind Kaminari that the villains are in fact not the underdogs in this situation, 
given that they're impossible to find right now and can really attack at any given moment. So they'll only do so when it favors them the most. Deku slips back a bit into his vigilante Deku persona and says that he has to influence their actions a bit by heading out and drawing some attention to himself, which makes Ida and the others remind Deku that they're in this together and there's no more solo survivor Deku stuff that's gonna fly while they're all there with him. Deku wonders if it's even okay for him to be seen around UA and if he's gonna have trouble getting back in. But Ida reminds him that Ochako's speech actually did move the hearts of the civilians, so they're much more understanding of a situation and they're more or less back to just being scared and confused with some level of hope and understanding of what's happening. This is where we cut away to Toru Hagakure who we saw before standing alone and now we know exactly what it is that she's doing. You see, Hagakure used her invisibility to hide behind a tree as she made her way over to check on Aoyama, who she says has been acting very differently since the events of the last war arc. Everyone's smiles are diminished, right? Things are definitely different after everything that's happened, but something is just off about Aoyama lately. So Hagakure tries to get closer to ask, but stumbles upon a shocking scene. In the forest, Aoyama talks of his parents, who plead with him to listen to what they're saying. Aoyama's mother tells him that they've gotten a new order that he must follow. And as the family sneaks away to an area outside of UA surveillance network, they remind Aoyama that he's already listened to All For One's orders in the past during the Kamino arc where All Might fought All For One. So what's the problem now? Why is it that Aoyama seems so heartbroken and shocked that he has to keep betraying his friends when he's been doing that even before he got into UA and before he ever met Deku? This tells us that All For One might have known more about Deku than we thought going into the beginning of the series, but this revelation that Aoyama is indeed the UA traitor was very shocking for some, especially people who don't watch this channel or follow me, despite the fact that we went full tilt on the Aoyama is a traitor theory on this channel, almost to the point where people were calling me insane for believing it. But who is insane now? It's here that we find out that all along, Aoyama has been working for his family, who themselves are working for All For One, to pay back the favor of All For One, granting Aoyama his quirk due to Aoyama being born quirkless. Aoyama's parents wanted him to be able to be just like everybody else. They wanted, much like All Might and Deku, to give Aoyama a chance at standing on a stage that he never would have been able to stand on his own. But the way that they did it is just so dark and shows the issues of having a villain who can make people's dreams come true if all they do is follow his evil desires. It's here where Aoyama begins to break down completely, crying and emptying his eyes of tears as he proclaims that he doesn't want to let his parents die for the sake of his friends, and that despite how hard it's been to deal with all the guilt and pain of what he's doing, he must because of the threat that All For One is posing to him and his parents. But it's at this moment when someone walks out of the tree line and Aoyama's family takes notice. It's Deku, looking broken at what he just heard. Deku says Hagakure came running to get him, saying something about Aoyama being the traitor, and he didn't want to believe it. But everything was confirmed to him right there on the spot. Aoyama continues to break down as he thinks about how he was the only one who couldn't say anything to Deku when they saved him or afterwards. He also thought about the letter that Deku left him and the burden that Deku's placing on himself that Aoyama only added to. And in this moment, Deku tells Aoyama that because he was the one that looked the most depressed after the end of the war arc, Deku came looking for him to check on him. And it's this last scoop of guilt that pushes Aoyama over the edge as he comes clean and tells Deku that everything he heard is true. And not only is Aoyama intending to help All For One even now, but he's also helped the villains all the way back during the training camp by giving away their location, as well as during the USJ incident all the way back at the beginning of the series, where Aoyama mysteriously disappeared for a while and was never seen to be in any danger. In this moment, Aoyama's parents try to grab him and run away from Deku, knowing that the lie is up, and here we have a flashback to Aoyama's past to see that his parents truly just didn't want their son to be different because being different is scary. However, because of this, they locked him into a life of obedience where he repeatedly has to follow All For One's orders. And in a desperate effort to commit to the side that he's chosen, Aoyama fires a laser at Deku, as he says that he fell into the deepest pits of despair after reading Deku's letter and realizing that all along, he was just like Aoyama who was also born quirkless. But somehow Deku still became such an amazing hero and that really just digs into Aoyama harshly here after all the terrible things that he's done. We see Deku activate full cowling to begin the fight with Aoyama and hopefully dodge his attack. And we also see Hagakure jumping in the way as she entirely deflects Aoyama's laser using her light bend 
bending technique. Hagakure herself can't believe what she just heard and stumbles angrily towards Aoyama as she begins to scream at him, saying this whole time everyone could have died because of you, and you had the nerve to live in the same dorms as us and pretend to be our friend. But when Aoyama's parents try to defend their son, Deku steps in using Black Whip and subdues all three of them with eyes full of tears and rage, as he tells Aoyama that this needs to stop right now. And he's very lucky that Hagakure was there to keep him from hurting anyone else, as Hagakure cries and we see some of her face for the very first time. Deku brings Aoyama and his family straight to All Might, who calls a meeting of Tsukauchi and Principal Nezu, and for one of the only times in the entire series, we see that the principal looks pissed, as he tells the rest of the class to please step out of the room so they can handle this privately. But Class 1A, isn't budging. They say there's no way they're leaving Aoyama's side, asking him for more details about what he's done, or asking him if this is really all true in disbelief. Aoyama's parents start to detail how this all started, saying that all for one's grip on them is due to how scary he is, noting that he showed them proof that anyone who works against him or betrays him is executed immediately, and that he always knows where they are and if they were lying to him, granting him full control over their lives and movements as long as they wanted to live. Aoyama chimes in and tells Deku that he really is just a no good villain, that everything they've been saying is absolutely right about him, but Deku isn't buying it. Then why did you say Tokoyami during the training camp when he was going to be taken away? Why did you leave me that message in cheese back then as a cry for help? Even now as you cry, are you crying because you couldn't do what All For One wanted, or are you crying because you think it's all over and you actually care about what we think about you and whether or not this friendship is real? Deku screams that no one should be named the villain for the rest of their lives just because they committed a crime, which is a really strong statement for him to make that I just love because we don't get to see a lot of how Deku thinks about things in the bigger picture. But this shows us that after committing the save Shigaraki and after the entire Vigilante Deku arc of Lady Nagant, Deku has changed and he's capable of seeing the world in a much more nuanced way than society at large currently does. So Deku raises his hands up towards Aoyama and says, take my hand, because no matter what has happened, you can still become a hero. As Deku says this though, Tsukauchi really starts bringing everyone back to solid earth and tells another officer to bound Aoyama's mouth and hands, telling Deku that regardless of all of that emotional stuff, he still helped All For One commit crimes, and that there's no guarantee that he isn't rigged to blow up right now, just like Lady Nagant was in the past. So they can't allow him to talk anymore after he gave up everything that they already needed from him, but this is where the rest of the class, including Bakugo and Kaminari, starts to realize exactly where Deku is going with this. Deku's plan is heroic in a sense, but also comes across as a very All For One style plan. Deku earlier told everyone that they have to try to influence the villain's action somehow to get the war to start when they wanted to, and everyone in the room realizes that Deku intends to use Aoyama as bait for All For One to show up exactly where they want him to. But as Tsukauchi still tries to bring everyone back to reality, as the entire class gives Aoyama an impassioned speech about how they all understand that he was too scared to act against All For One before, and how things are different now, we see Aizawa calling in through an iPad that President Mike is holding. And it's here where Aizawa tells Tsukauchi that he actually agrees with the students here, and as Aoyama's teacher, he has no intention of expelling him from UA, which is his right specifically due to his agreement with Nezu from before the beginning of the series. And it's here where Aizawa tells everyone that he has a plan as a teacher of Class 1A to help his students and everyone get their desired resolution here. However, we don't hear the plan itself, but everyone agrees that this is a logical plan to follow, so as Aoyama is wheeled away, Deku and the others say goodbye as we see Aoyama being transported through solid steel doors with tears in his eyes completely bound to a chair along with his parents. Following this, all of Class A returns to the dorms, and they try to go back to their day like usual, sitting around in the living room and making cups of juice and snacks to share, but it's extremely quiet and tense. We don't even see anyone's face during this time, until Hagakure speaks up and says, we will definitely beat them, as everyone in Class 1A responds, yes, out loud, and we see that each and every member of the class looks furious, like they're more driven now than ever to put a stop to All For One, who has made it personal of all of them one too many times. Elsewhere, while Deku and the others make their final preparations and repair their hero suits, while other heroes like Fatgum and the Big Three continue to search for anyone else that needs shelter before the final battle, we see Aizawa meeting directly with Aoyama through the glass, much like the scenes where Aizawa is meeting up with Shirakumo or Kuragiri. And it's here where Aizawa tells Aoyama to consider himself very lucky that his friend stood up for him, but reality is a little different from their sugar-coated version. In reality, there's no other option for Aoyama than to fight against All For One in this upcoming 
coming battle, to throw away any fear that he has of him, because when this is all said and done, unless Aoyama does something drastic to change the minds of everyone when this story is told, then Aoyama should fear the heroes in society and what they're going to do to him afterwards even more. Aizawa continues to say that right now, maybe they're just like All for One, using him for their own interest, but at the very least, they care enough about him to not let him die. That when everything is said and done, Aoyama is still one of Aizawa's students for the moment, and as long as that's true, they'll never send him in alone, and he'll always be able to walk alongside the rest of them, no matter how pathetic or miserable he feels. Time moves forward and a new day begins, and All for One places a call to Aoyama's parents to confirm that they've followed his orders. In response, Aoyama's mom uses a code to tell All for One that they do in fact have Deku isolated right where All for One wants him, and as they say this, we see Aoyama standing in front of Deku out in the city, and as the two stand alone by themselves, we see that All for One appears behind Aoyama right in front of Deku, bringing us to the beginning of My Hero Academia's final war. It was an early morning for Katsuki Bakugo as he prepped his hero costume in his room and thought about the day that he was about to have. Today was the day that they take everything back, the day where the heroes finally strike against the villains, and Bakugo can finally get back at Shigaraki and everyone who looked down on him or made trouble for his friends. Once Bakugo is ready, he attends a few meetings with the other heroes to discuss the plan for the operation to take down Shigaraki all for one and the entire league in one fell swoop. And afterwards, Bakugo heads to Shoto's room along with Kirishima, Ida, and the others to wait for their moment. Shoto tells everyone that he's sorry for making them worry about him and his family situation again, and that he doesn't even know what Toya likes or dislikes. But Bakugo says, I bet you a million bucks that that self-boiling freak loves Udon just like you. To which Shoto replies that if that's the case, he'd love to take Toya out to dinner sometime to really get to know his brother better. This bit of hope is nice to see from these two who are both about to be entrenched in their own battles and the rivalry and friendship between Shoto and Bakugo that has grown over the series is one that can be subtle at times but I find very rewarding for both of the characters. Aoyama places the call to All for One and tells him that he has exactly what he wants, Deku on a silver platter waiting for the Demon Lord. When All for One appears, he arrives and quickly summons his army of villains through his warp quirk while the heroes all come out of Kurogiri portals thanks to Monoma copying Kurogiri's quirk to give them an advantage here. There are a few brief skirmishes in this time, but ultimately the villains are sent into Iron Maidens, which spring from the ground and trap them all for all but three seconds, but this is enough for the heroes to capitalize. Each group picks an Iron Maiden, and the heroes are all split up as Kurogiri portals open and send battalions of heroes and villains all over Japan to various stage battlegrounds, like Gang Orca's Aquarium Island for Toga's group, the base of the All Might statue in Kamino Ward for Toya's group, Gunga Mountain Villa for All for One, and most importantly, the ground of the final battle, UA High for Shigaraki's group, where Deku and Bakugo would take on the man who's become their arch nemesis over the course of My Hero Academia, from the day that he invaded UA to the time where he stole Bakugo away, and even now, despite him needing to be saved, he does still present a massive danger to everyone unless he's stopped here. As the villains are scattered, we see Bakugo say Deku, and Deku quickly jumps to Bakugo's side and starts using his air force to keep the villains inside of their pods as the warp gate begins to send this group to its battleground. At the same time that this is all taking place, efforts have been going underway at UA to create a coffin for Shigaraki. UA has had extensive work performed on it by the support course thanks to Mei Hatsume and Nezu instruction as pillars shoot out of the ground around the school and fissures in the earth start to form as light breaks out of the cracks and a loud thrum like an ancient machine powering up can be heard. It's at this point where UA and the entire grounds around it start to rise higher and higher until UA is now flying, with giant gravity boosters revealed on the underside of the campus while rocks and rubble fall off the newly formed UA sky base. On top, on the pillars that have been erected around the main UA building, different rings start to light up as the pillars begin to activate and energy starts to collect from pillar to pillar like a sea of stars, activating all for the same purpose, as the connecting energy forms a sparking electrified force field around the school to keep anyone and more importantly anything from escaping. 
and Yue has made good timing on their ascension into the sky, as no sooner than the school heads towards the clouds do we see a portal opening on the surface, with people spilling out of it. The first person we see from the portal is Shigaraki himself, and quickly the others get into position and place themselves on various platforms that are strung up around the Yue arena in the air by giant wires that can be controlled by Best Genist. We see heroes like Edshot, Sun Eater, Nezure, and even Mirko, who returns of a brand new large support item prosthetic hand and a new sporty haircut. But something here is wrong, and the first one to notice is Bakugo. A second before Bakugo and the others are teleported away, out of the corner of his eye, Bakugo saw something yank Deku into another portal, sending him to a completely different area into a battle that we can discuss at another time. But as the news rings out to the other heroes, they each react to the fact that Deku isn't here, meaning their entire plan has already gone out the window, frame one. As Monoma's warp gates open, Gravity and Froppy lead the charge, shoving Himiko through one warp gate and taking with them several of her accompanying villains as well as near high end Nomus to Okuto Island, which is a resort island 200 kilometers away or 124 miles off of the mainland of Japan. Now, the idea of sending Toga all the way out here to such an isolated area is that they're trying to isolate Himiko somewhere where she can't escape. And to accomplish this, they use the Okuto Aquarium, which is actually run by Gang Orca to pretty much create a watery prison for Toga and the other villains. As the portals close, everything seems like it's going well, but in a flash, Toga uses one of her tubes from her blood-sucking machine as a wire that goes through the portal and wraps around Deku, pulling him in towards Okuto Island, which is miles and miles away, like we just said, from where he's supposed to be fighting Shigaraki. This causes a big issue, and now the area that Deku was in has no real way of holding off Shigaraki all on their own, and we've already told the story of everything that happens there, but soon we'll be back as the story does pick up at UA once again, but that's a story for another time. As Deku stands on the water at Okuto Island and he stares Toga and Ochako down, realizing the danger of this situation, he immediately tries to contact the Racerhead to try and get teleported back, but their strategy didn't really leave room for an error like this, since Monoma is busy using his quirk on Shigaraki and can't open another portal at the risk that the villains will use it to ruin their plan further. So Deku watches as the high end Nomus and the Water Star going crazy and attacking various heroes as the Aquarium battle begins, but he isn't supposed to be there and realizes that he can't get stuck here for too long. In that moment, Toga pops out of a bubble of water created by the waves and tries to get close to Deku, which surprises the boy since his danger sense isn't pinging off of her despite the fact that she's clearly trying to stab him. But maybe it's the fact that she's saying that she loves him while she smiles that's interfering with his quirk. While he dodges Toga, she tells him that she wants him to be her boyfriend, as nearby we see Ochako freaking out a bit watching Deku freak out to this question. But Toga explains her feelings and how they started after seeing Deku all injured during the first time they met. And Deku tells Toga that being a couple means doing cute stuff like going on dates. But Toga disagrees and says that to her, love is all about being the same as the person she loves. Finally, Toga asks Deku the question that's on her mind as she says, hey, what do you want to do with me? This is the same question she asked Ochako the last time that they met, as she tried to figure out if any of the heroes even had the thought of saving her on their minds. But Deku responds that even though he understands her feelings, he could never become one with someone who thinks about hurting the people that they love, because that thought is just too alien to Deku. Hearing this outright rejection, Toga thinks about Ochako's answer and hears Curious's voice start whispering in her mind a little, echoing the words that she told Toga during the My Villain Academia arc, where this top-selling author and journalist basically read Toga for what she is, a scared little girl, but still didn't quite understand her, leading to her twisting Toga's perception of herself slowly over time. Now, having been rejected by both Ochako and Deku, the two people that she thought would finally understand her, the only two people she thought could actually love her the way that she needed, and the only two people who Toga felt would ever actually try to save her, Toga abandons the idea of love, or at least the love that everyone else has, and instead gives into her true feelings, completely ripping off the small remaining fragments of the mask she always has on to hide her true self. Now, as as Toga attacks Deku and Ochako again, saying that they're just like her parents, Deku's danger sense finally kicks in as it realizes that this time Toga isn't attacking him out of love. But Ochako gets in the way and grabs Toga, telling her that she's been thinking about her ever since the last time that they fought, and saying that she realizes that the world rejected Toga. But right here, right now, she doesn't intend to do the same. So she wants to hear everything there is in the story of this lost girl, and she's prepared to accept whatever comes of it at the end. But it's already too late. 
Toga has taken her heart and thrown it in the darkest corner of her body. Even Ochako would have a hard time reaching it at this point. But not giving up, Ochako decides that she'll wade through the darkness and through the waters of Okuto Island as long as it takes to finally reach Toga and show her she understands her, or at the very least wants to. We see as Toga slips away from Ochako and causes a distraction, allowing her to stab Ochako in the back as she tells Ochako that she's sad about having to do this because since they both like the same boy, she figured that Ochako should have been able to understand her better than anybody. That she would have loved to have been Ochako's friend and shared stories about boys in love together if neither of them had the title of hero or villain. However, seeing Ochako getting injured, Deku activates his black whip and gets serious, tying Toga up as Froppy finally joins the fight as well and starts to help them all out. Ochako tells Deku that he can get out of there and go to Shigaraki because her, Froppy, and the other heroes have this handled, as Deku speeds away towards the original location, not knowing exactly what he'll find when he gets there. But this sets the stage for everything that's about to happen, as all of the girls grow group up to shut Toga down and finally put a stop to her rampage. And All For One specifically was teleported to Gunga Mountain Villa, the original headquarters of the Paranormal Liberation Front that we saw being raided in My Hero Academia Season 6. And as everyone starts coming out of the portals, we see All For One floating in the air with heroes like Endeavor there, Kamui Woods, Hawks, Tokoyami, and a lot of others who are also there to deal with all of the Nomu that have also been teleported to this location. But right as soon as we get there, we see that Hawks instantly goes in for an attack on All For One, he's still kind of nerfed from the fact that Dobby burned his wings in Season 6, Hawks comes here equipped with some brand new swords, and he instantly wants to try them out, and there is still a special one that he keeps tucked away for a later moment. Now Hawks strikes All For One on the mask, trying to break it right away since he knows that that likely is All For One's life support system, but All For One's new mask is incredibly sturdy, and it's not going to be easily broken. Endeavor and Hawks seem to be the two leaders of this operation against All For One, and they explain to All For One that they picked this location specifically because they know about his warp quirk and they wanted to split up all the villains in different areas that were far away enough that he couldn't just use that quirk to undo everything that they did. So right now, All For One, even if he wanted to, couldn't just teleport away to another location. He's pretty much stuck here. And it's here where All For One starts taking digs at Endeavor and things start getting personal very quickly. Because All For One's like, oh, that's cool. You split up all the villains, but you know by doing that, you also split up all the heroes. And you guys have a really dwindling resource of that at the moment. And if that's the case, then that means the only person left to deal with Dobby is Shoto, I suppose. How cruel, Endeavor. You leave your own two sons to clean up your mess. Now elsewhere, as All For One says, the battle between Dobby and Shoto is underway, but the iconic location that Dobby and Shoto's final battle takes place in is Kamino Ward, where All Might threw his final punch and All For One, for a time at least, was defeated. Dobby looks displeased with the fact that he's been separated from Endeavor, but takes a small victory in the fact that he's still in Shoto's area. However, as the destruction begins to spread, like his fire via the high-end Nomu that are along for the ride with him, Dobby hangs off the side of the All Might statue, taking in the nostalgic view of what reminds him of the Hosu City incident in the Stain Arc, where no more were attacking and fires raged on. Dobby floats up towards the air, almost looking like he wants to leave, saying, as usual, you won't look at me, huh? I can't get fired up like this. Is your third son and some of these lackey sidekicks supposed to stop me? Shoto tells Dobby that he chose to be the one to put a stop to Dobby, and he's nobody's puppet. As Burnin and the others ready to back him, and as Dobby's heat just gets stronger and stronger. This is when parts of his face start to melt away and crumble away to ash, as the muscles and bones in his face are exposed to Shoto in a horrifying sight. This is where Dobby tells his backstory, which we've covered on this channel in our The Day Toyo Todoroki Became Dobby video, which you can click on the card in the top right to watch for a more detailed explanation. But for a quick summary, Toyo was born with skin more like an ice user, leading Endeavor to stop training him for his own good, but the expectations that Endeavor had for Toya never stopped driving him to want to train and improve himself despite those injuries. So like a bad father, Endeavor decided that instead of just focusing on one of his sons and trying to help him out as much as he could, his end goal of surpassing All Might was more important, so logically he had to have a perfect son to kill two birds with one stone by surpassing All Might and breaking Toya's spirit enough to make him quit using his quirk. This leads to Toya burning up alone on Sakoto Peak and eventually being stabilized by the villains, and more time goes on and eventually he's the man we see before us today, ready to die for his goals. After explaining everything that's happened to Shoto in far more detail than I 
did, Dobby tells Shoto a little secret. He says that he's seen many of Endeavor's moves, and that's because he's devoted himself to making his flames as strong as possible for his ultimate battle with Endeavor. So Dobby ironically learned all of Endeavor's moves that he couldn't be taught by him just by watching the hero on the TV and on the internet. Dobby's heat easily melts the All Might statue in Kamino, and he launches a massive Hell Spider that sends the battlefield into chaos as they all try to dodge Dobby's hellish version of Endeavor's technique. But in the chaos, as Shoto tries to counter with something new of his own, Dobby absolutely blitzes him and starts demolishing Shoto both physically and mentally. He tells Shoto that he had everything given to him and he had everything one needed to be great but still chose to cling to others instead of shining on his own. For that, he'll never be a hero and those are words that Dobby's been wanting to say for Shoto for so long, I'm sure, specifically because that's what he was denied the most from Endeavor in favor of the perfect sibling. The issue though is that Shoto isn't actually worthless, he does have something up his sleeve. Through finally accepting himself in his origin, much like we saw with Shigaraki and we've seen with other characters who liberate themselves from their past, Shoto is able to use both sides together to create something brand new, his very own Quirk Awakening. Shoto brings out his new Phosphor move to take Dobby down, freezing multiple city blocks in an impressive clash using this new power that looks like a strange mix between fire and ice that stops combustion at its source and heat on anything that it coats. With a tragic clash between brothers finally at an end as it looks like Christmas in Japan, the battlefield calms down as the news of Dobby's capture rings through various locations that the heroes have trapped the villains in. But something is off. As one of Endeavor's sidekicks goes to check on Dobby's vitals, wondering how he's still alive under all that icy fire produced by Shoto's quirk, we see a small light in Dobby's chest starting to glow brighter and brighter until it flares like a miniature sun igniting into an egg-shaped armor of fire wrapping around Dobby. As Dobby grabs onto Endeavor's sidekick and sets him entirely ablaze at an instant with a heat wave that pushes back even the other fire users in the vicinity. Now Shoto has trained extensively to unlock this new quirk awakening, a new understanding of his quirk that allows him to push beyond towards his goals. However, Dobby is a natural genius, and as we've discussed, he's been able to copy Endeavor's entire arsenal practically, but him basically breaking Shoto's quirk awakening by awakening his own quirk to this new understanding and ability in a direct counter to Shoto is still extremely impressive. Shoto at this point has lost. Dobby has powered up way too much, and his heat has gone beyond the point where Shoto can reach him with his quirk or even his words, and as Shoto sits there with no actual way of reaching Toya, he watches as Dobby flies up and away into a Korrigiri portal to Endeavor's area, leaving precious Shoto alive because Dobby knows that the time is near. He only has so long left with the state that his body is in, so he needs to go finish things with Endeavor instead of trying to bring him Shoto's ashes as a gift. Honestly, I think that Dobby just wants to die with Endeavor looking at him though. Now, as a massive battle starts to break out between heroes and Nomu and different villains, on the ground under Endeavor, Hawks, and All for One, All for One leads Endeavor and Hawks on a wild chase through the sky in the mountains of the Gunga Mountain Resort, with them unable to land a meaningful attack on him for quite a while. But this all changes when the news of the Dobby vs. Shoto fight comes in over the hero communication system. The news comes in that apparently, Shoto managed to take down Dobby without killing him. And Endeavor just kind of floats in the air making a face, and it's not really clear what kind of face it is, with even All for One commenting, what's with that face? Is that relief? Is it sorrow? You couldn't even look at your son in the eyes. You just left little Shoto to go deal with him. So what's the matter? Wasn't this your plan in the first place? Don't tell me you're gonna justify it by saying something like, well, heroes have a lot to protect and I had to fight you. No, you could have been there when your sons were fighting, but you decided to come here and fight me. And that's why you're gonna lose today. And as All For One starts saying this, we see Hawk starting to realize that this is All For One's tactic to pretty much break down Endeavor's spirit first, but then then All For One puts one of his hands forward and we see a different quirk on each of his different fingertips showing that he's absolutely equipped for battle this time as he prepares all these different quirks to finally go on the assault. But not to be intimidated, Endeavor and Hawks move in, starting their attacks again on All For One. And we see Endeavor completely cloaked in flames with a large flaming fist overlaid over his already large fists. But this is when All For One flicks one of those fingers that has all of the quirks on it and we see a bunch of like crescent 
Forbidden Moon projectiles, kind of reminding me of Upper Moon 1 from Demon Slayer, and all these projectiles go towards Endeavor and Hawks as Hawks starts dodging it, but Endeavor uses his Hell Curtain technique, which is a big curtain of fire that blocks all of these projectiles. From inside of the Hell Curtain, we see fiery feathers shooting out towards All for One, who manages to dodge them by jumping backwards, and as All for One is jumping backwards, he flicks his thumb up into the air a different finger than before, and we see a bunch of black goo appear behind him, which materializes just in time to block a sneak attack from Hawks, who tried to fly around All for One and hit him in the mask with his double blades, and All for One says, trying to catch me off guard again, huh? and you used to call yourself fast. Not even recovery girl could restore your wings after what Dobby did to you. And here you are trying to outspeed me with those puny prosthetic wings. But unlike anyone else that we've ever seen All For One talking trash to, it seems like it has absolutely no effect on Hawks, who just puts on a really big smile at All For One saying, yeah, I guess it really is a pain, isn't it? This is when All For One turns around and realizes that Hawks here is really just a distraction. And if he can't actually do any damage to All For One, the person he really needs to focus on is right in front of him, and that would be Endeavor, who slams into All For One with two giant burning fists, doing repeated burning punches on All For One that he has to use all of his focus to block. And All For One flicks his ring finger forward, which is already covered in flame, and he uses a quirk called Pressurized Flame Curtain, mixed with another quirk called Impact Coil. But despite using these two quirks together specifically to counter Endeavor's flames, it really isn't having that much of an effect. Endeavor's flames are slowly getting through to all for one in this rapid assault. And to make things worse, you have Hawks literally flying around like Rock Lee doing the Hidden Lotus, hitting All for One all over with these swords and using the few feathers that he has to block any of All for One's little counterattacks that he's trying to do against Endeavor. But All for One starts to realize that there are actually little slips in Endeavor's attacks and there's a little bit of a desync between Hawks and Endeavor here. They're not completely in unison, which lets All for One know that something is wrong with Endeavor. Endeavor isn't actually putting all of his heart into this because he's focused on something else. So All For One starts to talk about all the heroes and students who are single-mindedly battling on the ground, but apparently Endeavor's the only one that's allowed to have his mind elsewhere. Why is it that he keeps worrying and thinking about his little masterpiece finally defeating his failed experiment? And as All For One's flame shield gets even bigger and Endeavor isn't actually able to hit him anymore, he starts to laugh at Endeavor and saying, shouldn't you be a little bit happier? If you want me to be honest, I've always been fascinated in your twisted lust for power. I've always had my eyes on you. Do you think that I was only looking at All Might and not the people around him? And as Hawks screams to Endeavor to ignore everything that All For One is saying and remember what happened to All Might and Kamino when he got distracted, Endeavor rushes in for a powerful attack on All For One, but All For One continues speaking with his flame shield up, saying, listen, anytime that I see the opportunity to create a villain, I do that. I love planting seeds whenever I stumble upon fertile soil. And if you need any better proof than that, why do you think that Toya's body was never found? Upon hearing this, Endeavor's face completely fills with like, blank despair. He looks broken, like something just breaks inside of him, realizing that All For One probably isn't lying here, and that All For One was the one that found Toya's body, meaning that Endeavor really could have found him, and things didn't have to go this way. And as Hawks thinks about how this manipulation is working on Endeavor, and how he needs to stay by Endeavor's side, he starts floating up to Endeavor, who has like a fire tornado forming around him, as he screams All For One's name, and we see that final finger that All For One hadn't used yet, chomping through Endeavor. Endeavor's side as it turns into a giant mouth with all these like drilled horns on it and All For One says, got him. And as Endeavor is down and starts crashing down to the ground, Hawks uses his remaining feathers to catch Endeavor and try to put him in prominence burn range, but he realizes that he can't dodge All For One's next attack, which is going to be a massive air burst like the ones that we saw Shigaraki using during the war arc in Season 6. So Hawks is in some real danger here as he's about to take this attack full force, but then something unexpected happens. Right as All For One releases his full power air burst technique, we see two people gliding in the air behind Hawks, and it's actually Tokoyami and Jiro, as Jiro uses her heartbeat wall to actually block All For One's technique and create a pocket of safety for Hawks. 
and Hawks is very thankful that he was saved, but he screams with Tokoyami and that girl from Class A, whose name he doesn't know, to stay away from this battle because they'll absolutely die if they try to fight all for one. However, Tokoyami responds, look, I know I'm no Endeavor, but you know that I can fight alongside you. As he says that, somehow through the mask, we can see that all for one does look pretty annoyed, saying that there's so many flies buzzing around here, but this kind of reminds me of those comics that I used to read when I was younger, where side characters like you only showed up to show how powerful the Demon King actually was when he took you down. However, not taking this old man seriously, we see Jiro telling All For One that that's really something that's better said after he wins, and now, suddenly, the battle between Jiro and All For One begins, a term that I'm sure not a lot of people saw coming. Endeavor crashes to the ground, holding his side as blood spills out of his mouth, thinking just what on earth is it that I'm doing? I know better than to let him get to me, but still, how could I let myself fall this far? All of this is still my responsibility. Everything that's happened until now, it's all on me. I can't put it on him and I can't get angry at him for it. So I need to clear my mind and get back up there and help my friends. And at the same time, Hawks realizes that he's in a situation where he honestly needs all the help that he can get. So he's gonna have to take it from Tokoyami and Jiro in this instance, because all he needs to do is buy time for Endeavor to get back into the air to end this fight against All For One. But All For One at the same time realizes the same thing and tries to find a weak spot in their defense. So his arm swells up really big and we see a bunch of snakes forming in his palm with human teeth and he compresses them in his arms before sending him out towards Jiro at a rapid speed. However, two of Hawks' feathers actually make it to Jiro in time, knocking her off of Tokoyami and floating her in the air to dodge the attack. All for one turns to look for Hawks really annoyed saying his name, but two feathers hit him in the back of the head and then as he turns to react to that, Hawks comes flying in from in front of him where he was just looking and hits him in the face with both of his blades using a spinning attack. But still, All for one's mask does and break. Jiro lands back on Tokoyami's back absolutely trembling and she says to herself Midoriya, Aoyama, so this is what you've been dealing with all this time? How terrifying. But all for one being as observant as ever goes you're shaking you poor thing. Did you think this was some sort of field trip? And he unleashes a massive attack in Jiro's direction that it doesn't seem like Hawks actually has time to react to. And at the same time with his other arm, All For One sends out an attack towards Hawks, really giving him a choice to either dodge or try to save the UA students. And of course, Hawks being the hero that he is, he completely takes All For One's attacks, using all of his remaining feathers to move All For One's other arm slightly out of the way so that the attack would miss Jiro and Tokoyami. But it doesn't actually necessarily miss them, with the attack still hitting part of Jiro's face and taking out one of her ears. And as All For One makes fun of Jiro for thinking that she's a main character because she rubs shoulders of all these other impressive people, Jiro says, all you do is talk about who's weak and who's strong, who's special, who can do this and that. Listen, I don't really care about any of that. All I know is you made my friends cry, so you're going to have to pay for it. And as she says this, using all of her emotions and all of her pain, Jiro lets out a massive heartbeat wall at All For One, kind of mimicking his giant air blast. And All For One prepares to counter this attack of a giant air blast of his own, saying that ability, motivation, spirit, all of that is useless and it's just for weak people. And all of that can easily be destroyed in the face of absolute power. So as All For One readies to just get rid of Jiro, who's this little annoyance on the battlefield, he finds that he actually can't use his quirk. And inside of All For One's vestige, world, we see the different quirk users whose quirks he's already stolen actually grabbing all for one and holding him back, making him unable to do anything in this instance. And inside of the Vestige world, all for one is absolutely confused to what's going on here, and he wonders if something happening of Shigaraki and New Order actually ended up causing this to happen, because why are the people inside of all for one fighting back against him now after all of this time? And it's here where all for one starts to realize that even a bunch of weak spirits when they work together can actually have an effect because he has to take the full brunt of Jiro's technique here as Hawks dives in for one final attack using both of his vibrating blades and thinks about how this entire time he has been hitting All For One's mask in the same exact place behind the head trying to form a crack which he has successfully done. So in this instance when All For One is being hit by Jiro's attack
attack, Hawks comes in and absolutely slams the blades into All For One's mask, breaking it and revealing All For One's face. And as this attack lands on All For One, Jiro, having 100% faith in Tokoyami, takes her jacket off and wraps it around Dark Shadow to give him even more darkness, and she literally just jumps off of Tokoyami's back in the air, saying, catch me in a second, but you have to do it now. And as she does that, we see Tokoyami and Dark Shadow flying in and forming a massive black fist, capitalizing on Hawks' attack to literally, in one motion, claw strike All For One in his face, sending him tumbling through the sky, as we see a massive smash sound effect, and All For One's mask gets completely completely shattered by Tokoyami. All for one gasp for air, trying to get another breath in, realizing that this is really, really bad. But the reason that he looks so confused is actually not just because he took that attack. All for one thinks to himself that he should have been able to dodge that strike with ease, but his senses are lagging behind. He actually wasn't able to see that the attack was coming his way. And I know you probably think, yeah, that's obvious because All for One doesn't have any eyes. But according to All for One, he's stolen so many different sensory quirks that he can even detect tiny little vibrations in the air that give him better senses than anyone else on earth so normally again he would have known that this attack was coming but something is off again it seems like those quirks inside of his body are actually rebelling against him and hindering him in this battle so we see all for one floating in the air probably taking a second to enter his mind palace and when he's in there we see the inner all for one growing very large and grabbing the quirk users who are rebelling against him and swallowing them causing chaos inside of all for one's vestige realm as Hawks is about to land the finishing blow to slice All For One's head and finally take him out. But in that split second before the blade actually connects with All For One, All For One finally comes back to his senses screaming pathetic. And we see a thousand of those long kind of red and black quirk tentacles that we've seen All For One and Shigaraki use extending outwards from All For One's body and slashing everything in distance. And when that happens, Hawks still somehow actually being very fast gets in front of Tokoyami and completely completely blocks the attack from hitting him as all those different tendrils start piecing All For One's mass together from all the tiny little thousands of fragments. But what we see as All For One's mask is reforming is that Endeavor actually got in the way of Hawks and took the majority of All For One's attack, grabbing some of it and even punching the rest of his arm with no fire on it to try to block the attack from hitting his friend. And as Endeavor tries to get through all of these tendrils, one of the tendrils actually pierces right through Endeavor's elbow, taking one of his arms off. But now more resolved than he's ever been in his life, Endeavor pushes forward ignoring all of the pain and ignoring everything as his eyes and his mouth go completely white, showing you that he's checked out and he's going to complete his goal, Endeavor blitzes forward towards All For One even still, seeing a version of himself that was much younger still in UA, looking at him saying, you're even weaker than you were before. And young Endeavor really starts to speak to Endeavor, calling him a failure, saying your conditions, your atonement, your mistakes and your responsibilities, all those things ever did for you were just exposed how weak you really are. And they turned you into the pathetic excuse for a hero that you are now. Stop trying to think that you're on All Might's level. Think back to your origin. Remember? Remember when dad tried to save that little girl from a villain and how they both ended up as nothing more than scorched lumps of flesh? Remember that being a failure is in your blood. No matter how jealous you are of All Might, the real Superman, no matter how you choose a hero name that actually meets hard work, everyone can see through how weak you are. And Endeavor stands up by grabbing the neck of his younger self in this vision, who says, yeah, you're never gonna be like All Might or Deku. All this time, you've been fighting against your own weakness and that's your own true enemy. Forget about being a better person. Forget about atoning for everything that you've done. Curse your own weakness like you have been your entire life because overcoming that weakness is the only thing that you've been living for this entire time. And in that moment, we literally see Endeavor strangling and burning his past as he flies in with a rage towards All For One with one of his arms still missing and the arm forms into a large giant flaming fist that he hits All For One with and actually does a lot of damage to the Demon King, saying that ending this fight is my responsibility and I'm gonna do that right now. All For One goes flying backwards saying that was way too close. And he says that he knew that someone on this day would push him to his very limits, but he didn't think that it was gonna be Endeavor of all people to start giving him flashbacks of the fight that he had against All Might back on that fateful day. And as he prepares himself to take Endeavor's next attack, we see Endeavor floating in the air with a giant swirling mass of flames behind behind his arm, 
as he readies what's going to be an amazing strike against All for One, but All for One is like, you can't possibly clear that distance before I can dodge or set up some sort of defense, so I'm going to be yo. And in that millisecond, we see All for One suddenly face to face with Endeavor, who suddenly is in front of him, thanks to Hawks putting his feathers on Endeavor's back, enhancing his speed and making him go even faster. Endeavor lets a massive vanishing jet burn go that sends a pillar of flame down to the ground, and we see All for One literally with his butt to the ground looking up into the air looking a little afraid as his flame shield is now completely broken. As All for One lands, we see that he actually lands in the middle of a battle that was going on between Kamui Woods and a couple other villains, and Kamui Woods looks up in the air and sees a massive pillar of flame coming down his way, so he jumps out of the way and says, everyone, move! And in that moment, Endeavor comes slamming down on top of All For One's shields and literally breaks through them, grabbing All For One by the neck, dragging him along the ground in a massive burst of flames. And it's here where the mask once again breaks, with All For One not being able to keep it all together. So All For One comments that his body isn't really listening to him, so all he can really try to do here is grab Endeavor and steal his quirk. So All For One lifts his hands trying to grab Endeavor by the arm, but Endeavor looks to the side and actually shoots out some flaming fire laser beams from his eyes that completely singe and burn all for one's hand so he can't actually make contact with Endeavor. Endeavor's eyes start smoking and he looks at all for one saying the only thing that your hand has ever done is destroy people's lives and all for one yells back saying you've destroyed lives too with Endeavor saying yeah Toy Eye is really only the product of all of my errors. All the people that he's killed with his quirk those are also all my responsibility. However, despite that, I can't change the past. And it's here where Endeavor starts shooting up into the air, reminiscent of what he did against the high end Nomu. Endeavor thinks to himself that his wrath, his resentment, and even his retribution all woven together form the fabric of the future. But what is that future? In his mind, Endeavor thinks of Shoto, and he thinks of the endless possibilities that Shoto and all the other 1A students have. He even sees a vision of all of them looking older, with Shoto walking towards the rest of his classmates, all as the next generation of heroes. And Endeavor tells All For One that no matter what he did and what responsibility he bears, he has to be the one to bear the punishment for all of that so it doesn't become an obstacle in the way of the future for Shoto and everyone else. So even if it means that Endeavor has to give his life, he's gonna be the one to end this so he can keep looking over Toya and he can keep everyone safe. Even if that means to the very end, he just has to keep on hating himself. And as Endeavor says this, literally bear hugging all for one, he unleashes a point blank, full power, full blast prominence burn that looks like a massive burning sun in the sky. And as the fire finally starts to clear, we see All For One's body completely charred and starting to break apart, looking the worst that anyone has ever looked in the series, even worse than Shigaraki did when Endeavor did the same exact thing to him. And Endeavor is thinking, thank the Lord that's over because I have nothing left. I'm completely gassed out. However, we already know that All For One doesn't have any sort of regeneration quirk. And even if he did, there's no surviving that attack that I just did unless he had a body exactly like Shigaraki's, which he didn't have any time to prepare since his escape from Tartarus because we took the doctor into custody. So as All For One's body literally starts turning into dust, we see Endeavor taking a sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, my job is done here. However, that's when we hear Hawks screaming towards Endeavor, get away! And to Endeavor's utter shock, he hears All For One start to speak. All For One says, did you really believe that I would step onto this stage in this final battle without an ace up my sleeve? You more than anyone should know that my body is completely useless. There's not really any point in preserving it anymore. So you know what? I wanna try something. Let's see if my little experiment actually worked. And as everything goes black, we see a quirk erasing bullet falling into a realm of darkness. And as it falls, we see that All For One is actually picturing Aerie saying, you know, heroes aren't the only ones prepared to risk their lives because villains are also the most dangerous when they're wounded. And as he says this, we see a giant grin appearing on All For One's face as his ears and his eyes from before his injury against All Might starts to reform as All For One has seemingly taken Aerie's rewind quirk from the quirk erase bullets, meaning that All For One is about to rewind to his prime and everyone on this battlefield is absolutely screwed. 
But still, they stay positive and decide to continue on anyway, hoping that Deku will arrive eventually to get back in sync with their plan. Now, Shigaraki looks over the horizon and instantly realizes that they're in the sky. But also, he notices that he is the only villain that they brought to this area, meaning that this is a zone specifically meant for him. So with no one around to get in his way or for him to worry about, he sets his hands on the ground and begins to decay the entire UA sky base as a trail of decay erupts from the ground and begins to spread. But again, something is wrong. And before Shigaraki can even notice it, the space that Shigaraki is standing on erupts out of the ground, sending Shigaraki flying upwards as the other sections of the ground affected by the K also spring out, leaving the rest of the sky base safe from the spread of Shigaraki's quirk. As it seems like the heroes have created a modular system to specifically counter Shigaraki's decay that will punish him for using it by rejecting any piece of the ground that's affected by it and knocking it and him into the electrical force field around UA. Shigaraki realizes is what's going on here, and he tells Genus and the other heroes that this battle of attrition ends with their loss, since eventually they'll run out of solid ground to stand on. But little does he know that everything that gets destroyed is being replaced by a solid team of builders like Momo, Cementos, and other support students like Mei Hatsume. But back on the surface, Katsuki Bakugo locks eyes of his prey and rushes towards Shigaraki, who attempts to use his quirk to blow them all away. But he's unable to, thanks to Aizawa and Monoma using Erasure on. Him. However, this is where Shigaraki does something extremely strange. You see, ever since the end of the war arc in Season 6 of My Hero Academia, Shigaraki has been healing his body and perfecting the fusion between him and All for One. And after the Star and Stripe fight, which we've also discussed already and you can find in the card in the top right, during the time that it took for Shigaraki's body to heal once again and become as complete as it can be without All for One's direct intervention, something changed. And somehow, Shigaraki went beyond just awakening his quirk. In fact, Shigaraki claims that in this moment, he has reached the peak of what we call the Quirk Singularity. And as he pulls back his arm, we see a swarm of fingers growing out of Shigaraki's arm as he swings his arm forward and sends a concentrated wave of fingers towards Mirko, catching her in his attack and shocking everyone. Shigaraki gets really disappointed in Aizawa who relies on the same tactic over and over and couldn't get around this new technique. As his new... <laughs> finger ability goes full blast, and we see a giant wave of fingers shooting out in every direction, to the point where the wave crashes into the top of UA and destroys half of the building. It's a truly strange sight and no one knows how to respond, but Bakugo looks on, already calculating in his head, as he sees Mirko landing in front of him, telling him to stand back. You're the one who should stand back, says Bakugo, leading to an argument between him and Mirko that almost turns into a fight. But the two focus up as Best Genus calls the group together upon hearing the news that Deku won't be arriving for a while due to him having to literally fly there from over 200 kilometers or 124 miles away. And this is where Best Gina says, who cares if One For All is in Hero Fuss? We can beat Shigaraki here and now. And if we do so, we'll save Deku from the work of having to do it himself. And as everyone says, yeah, and resolves themselves to take down the Prince of Darkness, Shigaraki starts to surf along his moving wave of fingers like he's in Sonic Adventure 2. As the fingers begin to seek out and attack the heroes, and they try their best to dodge and make their way to the main body. We see Nezure and Tamaki getting hit by attacks, but being otherwise okay, as Mirko and Edshot easily dash their way through, and Genus uses one of his wires to save Bakugo from a close call. Shigaraki monologues as he spots Bakugo, answering an earlier question from Edshot, but Bakugo has had enough. He says, I don't know if you're all for one or Shigaraki right now, but frankly, ever since Kamino, I've been sick of both of you, and I don't want to hear one more word. As Bakugo says this, something starts to form from his back, and we see that Bakugo has a new support item, which turns into a series of blasters mounted on his back, as well as a small pair of auto turrets that sit on his shoulders, as Bakugo busts out his brand new area-suppressing strafing panzer armor. Now, Bakugo cuts through the chit-chat and heads straight straight for Shigaraki with both hands and his new explosions, sending him quickly towards the villain, as his new support item clears a path through the fingers for everybody else. Bakugo thinks about what Shigaraki was just saying though, that misunderstandings in this world between the people who exist today and the ones that will exist once quirks reach singularity like his did, will lead to fear and rejection and ultimately ruin in the current society. Bakugo thinks about how he feared and rejected Izuku for being the way that he was despite not having a quirk, and then 
even more once he was given a quirk that would allow Deku to constantly put himself in danger. Bakugo tells Shigaraki that he's already accepted fear and rejection long ago, and that he's beyond all of that now, because he found people willing to just move forward towards progress and happiness, no matter what it takes to get there. So as long as people like that exist, it doesn't matter what happens. The world won't turn out like Shigaraki says. And as Bakugo says this, he locks eyes of Shigaraki as he finally breaks through the swarm of fingers that were protecting Shigaraki. And now with all of his possible energy packed into his hand, looking like Bakugo is literally holding a star, he slams it into Shigaraki, who reaches forward, desperately trying to counter. And... BOOM! We see the most massive explosion that Bakugo has ever generated in the series, with a giant blast that was even bigger than the entire UA sky base by a multiple of at least three, as star-shaped explosions go off outside of the cage, showing just how powerful and how far-reaching this ability went. That, mind you, Bakugo hit Shigaraki with at point-blank range. And as everyone below worries about whether or not Bakugo just destroyed half of UA with that attack, Kaminari tells us that Bakugo isn't the kind of guy to completely disregard his surroundings, and we see that the UA barrier is still up. But that might be the first sign that something didn't go as planned here. Sometimes, in some battles, any pretense that you can hold back at all needs to be thrown away. And sometimes, even the ground you walk on has to be destroyed for you to make any ground in the battle after all, no matter who else is standing on it. Here, it's possible that Bakugo held back slightly to not actually destroy the cage around UA, but regardless, we see the result of the attack, as Shigaraki's arm had reached out, injuring half of Bakugo's face as Shigaraki catches Bakugo's arm, stopping the full force of Bakugo's attack from reaching him, despite the fact that it did seem to at least impact the opposite side of Shigaraki's face. Shigaraki calls Bakugo's quirk and the way that he used it here truly wonderful, but says that's exactly why he had to destroy Bakugo's ability. And as he says that, he squeezes and we see Bakugo's arm absolutely wrung like a towel. As Shigaraki tells Bakugo that he's still not interested in him anymore, as he tries to crush him with the fingers once more, but the other heroes rapidly enter to the fray to try and stop him. Because of this, Shigaraki changes plans and drops Bakugo, taking a portion of his other arm to slam the heroes away with his All Might-like power that he still has from the war arc in Season 6. As Bakugo tries to recover from what just happened, he thinks, this is impossible. There's no way that the gap between me and him is really this much. But that's where Shigaraki reveals to Bakugo that he never really cared about his quirk or his dreams or anything like that. In fact, the only reason he's ever been interested in Bakugo, even back when they took him from the forest, is because he's Deku's best friend. And that makes him the perfect tool to use against Midoriya. As Shigaraki stomps towards Bakugo, preparing to turn him into a gift for Deku, the big three of UA spring into battle with Mirio back at their side in an attempt to save Bakugo. But Shigaraki steps on Bakugo anyway and tells him that he knows knows that Deku will be there any moment now. So in all honesty, he's actually glad that his quirk is erased currently, since when he takes Bakugo out, there will be something left for Deku to rage over again, like he did when Bakugo was injured in Season 6. So Shigaraki can just take advantage of that to get one up on him. And that since Bakugo is just a tool to him, he'll end here always being in Midoriya's shadow, as Bakugo has a vision in his mind of Shigaraki crushing him with his fingers, much like Deku and Bakugo's vision in Season 6, when they saw themselves being erased away. Now during this, the big three work together as Nezure gets Shigaraki's attention and then Sun Eater hits Shigaraki with Scorpion Venom, but this just seems to make Shigaraki evolve even further as a mouth opens up on Shigaraki's shoulder to spit the poison out, and suddenly mouths start to open up all over the waves of fingers, screaming and chomping down as Tamaki freaks out over the absolute horror show happening before him. And as Shigaraki liberates himself once more, laughing and showing excitement over what he's able to do, Mirio sneaks up on him using his quirk and still steals Bakugo away, throwing him to a waiting genus thread, as Muriel starts to take on Shigaraki, despite not really having the power to actually hurt him, which we do see as this fight goes on. Muriel is, though, a good distraction for Shigaraki, while Bakugo gets a few seconds to rest, as Best Genus offers to wrap him up and heal him, since of course his fight is over. But Bakugo is still watching everything that Shigaraki is doing, and he ignores the pain in his broken arm as Best Genus starts to wrap it up, as he watches Shigaraki and notices that an attack 
back to the right might actually work, since his earlier explosion made Shigaraki's right eye unavailable, and it still hasn't yet been healed. Meaning that there is an opening, but how in this state can Bakugo take advantage of it? As Tamaki lets loose a giant beam to try and wipe Shigaraki away, he and the others fail to really do any damage, and Shigaraki starts to boast about how none of them would have posed a threat to All Might in his prime, which is exactly what level he's on. Wait. Shigaraki quickly turns his head to the side. A single footstep was enough to get his attention on the left, and the man that took that footstep was Bakugo, who takes another step forward and then another, as Shigaraki's stare sharpens because something is again wrong. There are little sparks popping all around Bakugo, and as Bakugo says we still have a battle to win, right Izuku? He looks like he's barely on his feet, but he seems to almost teleport over to Shigaraki with a blast right to the face as Bakugo's speed reaches an entirely new level and this battle starts to ramp up. Somehow Bakugo is able to completely blitz Shigaraki and then just as predicted, Shigaraki swings with his right and Bakugo dodges that attack, getting behind Shigaraki as the sparks around Bakugo flare up even brighter than they ever have in all sort of different colors as Bakugo lets loose his final attack. And it seems like Bakugo has an entirely new sort of state of power that the narrator does take a little time to explain to us. The narrator explains that because Bakugo developed his cluster technique, he didn't realize that there was also a special effect or a side effect that causes sweat in his palms to open new pathways in his body due to him trying to store too much sweat in one area. So over time, without realizing it, Bakugo is actually optimizing his body to handle and release explosions from everywhere. And now these micro explosions were going off in and around his body, propelling him with amazingly enhanced speed, but doing damage to him all the same. In this moment, just like how Deku has learned so much from Bakugo and taken a lot of that stuff to make it part of his style, it seems like Bakugo has very similarly created his own version of one for all full cowling, proving that Bakugo with his own effort became a character actually able to keep up with the power of one for all, meaning in the future he could likely become an amazing hero probably even on that level with Deku. But that's assuming that he does have a future. Bakugo wonders if this is what Deku feels like when he's fighting, and he thinks to himself, hey Izuku, do you think I'll ever reach you someday? Have I caught up to you now? And as Shigaraki freaks out, seeing a vision of the second user of One For All, he lashes out towards Bakugo attempting to counter the attack with one of his own, and in that instant, with both techniques released, everything goes white. And it stays white for a while. And a while longer. And even then, a while longer before we see Bakugo standing in this now all-white world. He finds himself here, but he's confused. What's happening? He thinks for a moment and then he hears something to his left. So he turns his head and that's where he spots something odd. Before him is a flame, standing in the shape of a man, and he can recognize exactly who it's supposed to be. It's All Might. Or at least the vestige version of All Might from within One for All. Oddly, just here with Bakugo in this moment. Bakugo goes, Oh yeah. I forgot. Listen, since we met in a really strange way and with everything going on since then, it never really felt like the right moment, but... He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a legendary rarity hero trading card with All Might on it. One that he remembers him and Deku both getting on the same day and being so thrilled for. It all seems silly now. But Bakugo says, I always wanted you to sign this for me. And in that moment, everything goes black. And we hear a heartbeat as we see Mirio, Nejire, Sun Eater, Mirko, and even Genus's threads all trying to stop Shigaraki as his attack breaks past all of them and pierces right into Bakugo, sending him flying with a cavity in his chest and a large hole in his heart. From this attack, he skips along the ground and Best Genus fails to catch him before seeing for himself what he unfortunately has to describe to everyone else, that Katsuki Bakugo is dead. 
But after all of this, our story continues as Dobby looks down at Shoto having won their battle using his new quirk awakening, and the villain decides that there's no reason for him to die here battling his little brother. So he calls for Kurigiri to open a portal to him to go over to Endeavor's area, where things aren't going any better for the side of the heroes, given the fact that Endeavor's battlefield is entirely responsible for All for One and his army of Haya Nomu that are all supported by villains. At the end of our last video, we described how narrowly Endeavor and the others were able to seemingly win against the Lord of Darkness darkness all for one himself, in a battle that cost Endeavor his arm and dangerously injured him to the point where he was starting to find it hard to move. However, this wasn't the end of All for One who proceeds to tear a swath through the heroes on his path towards All Might and Deku, but that's a story for another time. Today we focus on the man cloaked by flames with a past hidden in the darkness, Enji Todoroki, otherwise known as Japan's number one hero, Endeavor, who despite how exhausted he is, before Endeavor stands to completely revive All for One with the prime body that he used to fight against All Might and an all new ability to rewind through any danger that comes his way. The very moment that Endeavor falls to his knees thinking about how he has to do everything he just did all over again with even more difficulty now, a portal opens behind All for One, revealing Endeavor's son Toya Todoroki, who looks horribly burned as in his ruined mental state, the boy yells, hey there dad, as fire erupts out of Kurigiri's portal and other portals even still appear nearby, from which a thousand thousand twice clones began to spill out onto the various battlefields field as a result of events happening in Ochako and Toga's battlefield, but that as well is a story for another time. The moment that Hawks makes eye contact with the clones of Twice, he screams that they need to kill Twice now. However, it's almost as if Hawks' call falls on deaf ears as three major threats stand on the battlefield and no one knows which one to go after first. Not giving them time to think, Twice continues to multiply and multiply as he fills the battlefield of the sound of an opponent the heroes never thought they'd have to fight again. But lingering above it all, in the skies on top of this battlefield, we have Dobby, who reminds us how little he actually cares about Twice as his fire rampages from within his body and spews onto the horde of Twice clones and Dobby tries to burn as many heroes as he can, as he figures that the Twice clones are good enough kindling to make sure the flames spread across the heroes, so why not? This looks like hell on earth for the heroes that live through it. However, to make things even more hectic, we see as Ochako Uraraka and her best friend Froppy narrowly exit through a Kurogiri portal onto the battlefield, promising to find some way to deal with the Twice clones created by Himiko Toga's quirk. And taking a little pressure off of the big shot heroes, we watch as Endeavor uses his remaining arm to easily battle through a wave of Twice clones as his son floats in front of him, causing Endeavor to worry about Shoto. Toya. What happened to Shoto? He asked. As Dobby tells Endeavor that he wanted to turn Shoto's corpse into a present for their father, but he was too strong, which makes sense because of all the work Endeavor put into his perfect little project. However, Dobby congratulates Endeavor on this by saying he managed to raise a hero strong enough to make sure that Dobby's dream can never be completely fulfilled. However, Shoto will be the only person that Endeavor loves and cherishes that'll survive this night, as Dobby still has a plan for taking out the entire Todoroki family, despite the fact that he shouldn't even be able to move right now. All for One takes the time to attack Hawks during this conversation between the Todoroki family, however, feeling confident with the promise of Twice being handled by someone else, Hawks tells Endeavor to take Toya elsewhere and stop him no matter what it takes, because he'll deal with All for One himself. All for One starts to laugh at Hawks as the hero continues on to tell Endeavor that no one here can handle Dobby's flames, and if this battlefield falls apart, it's all over for Deku's battlefield since that's the first place All for One will go. All for One continues to laugh at Hawks saying, you're so cruel. Can't you see your friend just lost an arm? He's barely conscious, and still, you're telling him to cruelly handle his son while abandoning his duty of defeating me like a good number one hero should. But being a bit of a smart ass himself, Hawks replies saying, our number one hero already beat you once today, so he deserves a new task while I take you down myself. Down on the ground, we see Endeavor standing as he stares Dobby down, who hasn't heard a single word that anyone else has said in his extreme focus on his father. As Dobby flies full force, full speed towards Endeavor, who activates his flames for the last time, he hopes. As the Todoroki family works towards its ending, and Endeavor tells Dobby that from this moment on, he won't take his eyes off of him. That from now on until the very end, he'll watch over him until everything is over for the both of them.
Now here's where we'll look away from Endeavor and Dobby for a moment as the two fly away from the Gunga Mountain battlefield for a while to the place of their final battle. But the story of the Todoroki family continues to spread itself like a fire or like ice across the surface of a frozen lake. First off, during this entire battle between the villains and the heroes, the team over at UA came up with an interesting solution for what to do with the civilians since nowhere would be safe for them. And this was to create a huge number of escape pods that acted as smaller individual shelters for everyone that didn't take part in this battle. Battle. Inside these pods, we see various characters that we've seen around town over the course of the series, but in one particular pod, we see the pair of Tetsu 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 Tetsu, as well as Kendo from Class 1B, who patrol their very own shelter cube as they begin their journey from UA's grounds in a long underground path that was dug straight between both schools. As Kendo walks around within her evacuation cube, suddenly it stops moving along the maglev rail system, which pushes everyone for a moment and causes quite a bit of confusion as everyone starts to wonder if they're stuck and if they traded one bad situation for another. At UA, we see Sukauchi and his new assistant Labrava sending a message to the cube letting them know that somehow the transportation was stopped from the inside, causing the heroes to look around for anyone suspicious and that's exactly what they find. Inside the pod, there's a man of a bowl cut hairstyle who activates his quirks sending electricity arcing between two of his fingers and as this catches Kendo's attention, she calls out to Tetsu Tetsu to apprehend their suspect. However, right at that moment, parts of the ceiling start to cave in around them, causing some retired heroes to leap into action protecting protecting their fellow civilians by catching the rubble. And as Death Arms looks down with tears in his eyes, saying that his body moved before he had a chance to think, proving that he still has the soul of a hero despite leaving everything behind at the end of My Hero Academia Season 6, he looks down right into the beautiful grayish blue eyes of Fuyumi Todoroki, who stands beside her brother Natsuo Todoroki and their mother, Rei Todoroki all huddled together as they thank the hero for saving them. But everyone starts to worry that there might be more danger on the way, as back at UA, Sukauchi starts to panic as Labrava realizes exactly what the cause of the lingering sense of danger is. Labrava realizes that their systems have been hacked, but she's already dealt with that. However, during that process, it's possible that Skeptic managed to share some pretty crucial information with Dobby, which was the path of the evacuation cubes that are going from UA to Shiketsu. The problem here is that in what seems to be a major oversight by UA, the path from UA to Shiketsu actually has a dangerous location right in the middle between both locations, and that would be the Gunga Mountain Villa, where Dobby is still leading Endeavor away to a specific location when we see the Todoroki family and everyone inside the cube rush to get out since it continues to cave in. When the Todoroki family makes it outside, all they see is the color blue reflecting off of the forest roughly a few hundred meters away, hard to miss during this dark night, as it seems like again, Dobby has taken every step to make sure he and his family would be reunited again. Trying to find some hope that they can maybe avert a crisis here and at least keep the family away from their horrible son, Tsukauchi grabs one of his aides and tells him to explain the situation of Dobby's body and why they're getting such weird heat readings off of him, but the aide begins to shake as he stares at the computer screen and even falls to the ground, screaming that while Dobby is leading Endeavor away, he's actually compressing thermal energy deep within his heart, and this energy has continued to build up and surge within Dobby's body to the point where they believe there's no safe way for the villain to disperse of this energy, since Dobby himself is barely clinging to life with a body that is already starting to fall apart. This leads the aide to theorize that what Dobby is actually doing here is turning himself into a massive thermal energized bomb that would not only be capable of literally turning Endeavor into a shadow on the ground, but in the ensuing high pressure explosion everything within five kilometers or roughly three miles will instantly be flash burned within the blink of an eye and completely cremated. Sukauchi's heart sinks into his stomach and then it goes deeper and deeper, like a coin thrown into a bottomless well of darkness as the sound of his heartbeat gets even further and further away from him and everything begins to go quiet in the detective's mind. He is panicking as the road to the victory that the heroes have wanted so badly starts to disappear in front of him, and Tsukauchi's world begins to crash as he realizes that they've been outplayed and the Todoroki family is well within the range of Dobby's explosion, with no way of getting them in every other shelter pod out of the area, since at this point even the evacuation cubes that have managed to start moving are all within the range of Dobby's explosion. Even a victory here against Shigaraki and All for One would be at the expense of all of the lives in Japan that the heroes have been entrusted with. And feeling like he'd lost, Tsukauchi falls to the ground. But at that moment when everything has fallen silent, Tsukauchi hears it. He starts to feel it. It's coming from a weird place, specifically his back pocket on his butt. But the sound that Tsukauchi is hearing, the vibration that Tsukauchi is feeling, is hope. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. 
All the way back in Kamino Ward, in the center of All Might Plaza, we see as Todoroki struggles to stand up, and his friend Ida catches him, telling him that he still hasn't recovered from his last activation of Phosphor Technique, which if you recall is Shoto's Quirk Awakening. However, Shoto responds that he's fine, because even though his battle of Dabi is over, he still needs to reach Midoriya because he can still fight. Ida says, listen, I know right now your mind is still racing of thoughts about Toya Todoroki. It makes sense. Your brother got away and you're thinking you haven't done enough. But Todoroki, no, Shoto, listen to me. You've done enough, and you've already done all you can do today. Tenya then tells Shoto that he can't understand how frustrated he is after facing his brother, but Shoto once told him to never forget who he wants to become, and starts to cry as he sees the look on Shoto's face filled with rage and regret, questioning why such a kind person has to go through such a hard path. But at that moment, when even these two are looking for hope, a call comes through on Ida's communicator device, and instantly it catches both of the boys' attention as the call is from All Might. All Might says, oh great, you're both safe. Good to hear, but sorry, I've got to be brief and give you even more to do. All Might proceeds to explain the situation revolving around Dobby and the evacuation course to Shoto and Ida, telling them that he needs the two of them to go to Gunga Mountain Villa as quick as they can to save everyone, and telling Ida that he knows his legs will be able to get him there because he's seen Ida in action himself all the way back during the first arc of My Hero, when Ida was the one to go and get all the UA teachers to come and save the students. All Might then turns his attention to Shoto, saying, don't worry about All For One, because a strong ally is on his way to take care of him. Just put your heart in everything you've learned into stopping Toya and reassuring everyone by becoming the ideal version of yourself in this moment, saying that if they have any chance of averting a major catastrophe from happening right now, they're gonna need Ida's engine and Shoto's half hot, half cold. And with that, All Might signs off to begin a battle of his own, but Shoto is still kinda skeptical considering the fact that Ida's engine stalled out way earlier in the battle. It's here where we see Ida shoving his mask onto to Todoroki, which spreads over Shoto's body as it becomes more of Ida's armor meant to protect Shoto, as Ida rubs up his engine to maximum power and takes off from the ground of All Might Plaza into the sky, cutting through different buildings, telling Shoto that his power and his engines have always been for guiding lost children. As the pieces begin to move in place, this story of ice and fire finally raises the curtain on its final act, as a giant sphere of highly pressurized thermal energy begins to form in the Gunga Mountain Forest, about 800 meters away from the All For One battlefield, as Endeavor falls to the ground and his body starts to singe all over, just from being near the burning entity of rage that is Dobby. Over his communicator, which is barely working at this point, Endeavor gets the news that Dobby is going to explode and understands the range of the blast and what he has to do to stop it. But understand that both Shoto and Endeavor here are acting without the knowledge that the Todoroki family is actually inside one of those evacuation cubes that stopped within the range of Dobby's blast, since it was decided that informing the two of this fact would give them far too much pressure that they don't need given the already extremely high stakes. However, even without that knowledge, Endeavor realizes that Dobby's explosion would also mean the end for everyone still trying to take down Toga and twice as clones, meaning we'd also have to say goodbye to characters like Ochako, Froppy, Jiro, and even more. So Endeavor stands his ground and looks up as Dobby falls down towards him like a burning sun coming down from the sky with a beast at its heart. As Dobby screams, Dad! Look at me. As he activates his quirk in one of his arms that swells up, no longer being able to contain Dobby's flames, as Dobby creates a massive fist made of fire that crashes down on Endeavor and covers his entire body in intense burn. Endeavor doesn't see Dobby right now though. Through the flames, he sees his small son Toya saying, look what I can do. When in reality, Dobby sacrificed his own arm and now looks more like his father than ever before. As Dobby rushes towards Endeavor and the giant flaming fist burns right through the ground and starts to boil the earth itself, large eruptions of molten magma fly out at random, burning Endeavor even more as he lands right in Dobby's path, yelling, Put out your flames, Toya! Please! Enough! I don't want you to die. Dobby opens his mouth as wide as possible as the sides of his mouth burn away and break, allowing it to crack and stretch even further as it looks like the blue flames of hell are dancing within the areas of his mouth and from those flames come the words, Natsukun, look.
Endeavor realizes that, probably due to the sheer amount of pain that Dobby is in, along of the madness from finally having his twisted goal within reach, the boy is no longer truly there as he's lost himself in his madness. But Endeavor isn't far behind as he thinks that he's barely able to stay conscious right now due to the heat which is even starting to burn him through his flame resistance. Endeavor is losing consciousness as Dobby stands on Endeavor's legs continuing to burn everything around them in a massive dome of fire. But in the heart of the storm, it's a heart that Endeavor starts to look for as as he looks at his son's chest and starts to push aside the flames from Dobby's quirk awakening that leave a X on his body that marks the spot of another shocking realization for Endeavor that happens in this moment when he moves the flames aside and sees something he never expected to see, which was ice that isn't being melted by his flames that he put there using his very own ice quirk. In Endeavor's mind, he remembers all of the explanations he's ever heard of someone's quirk awakening in a crucial moment, of how in a near-death experience, a person's quirk can even grow sometimes to take on new properties which are sometimes based on their lineage, and how right now in front of him, the proof that none of this ever needed to happen is right there. Proof that Dobby was truly perfect all along, and all of the pain that the Todoroki family endured over the years could have been avoided. Now, cutting away again, we have the Todoroki family who once again was just barely able to escape from their evacuation cube into the bright blue forest of the Gunga Mountain Villa. It's here where instantly realizing whose flames those are, we see Rei Todoroki grabbing hold of one of the helper robots that are helping the civilians get free and catching a ride right into the flaming forest, as Fuyumi and Natsuo do the same behind their mom, chasing her towards the center of Dobby's thermo energy bubble. Back at Endeavor's location, he starts to black out as he sees Toya as he looked the last time that he saw him with his white hair and without any new burns as it looks like the two are dancing with both of their missing arms being replaced by flames and Endeavor tells Toya that all of this is his responsibility and that he thought that he had to stay alive to make amends for what he did to his whole family but this entire time he didn't realize that Toya has been watching him and only growing angrier and angrier and says that for that he owes Toya amends more than anybody else and to fulfill that at the very least he won't let his son die alone but he can't let him drag everyone else into this either. So Enji's heart, no, his soul itself begins to burn as he grabs Dobby with all of his strength and starts to rocket up towards the sky. But just as they get off the ground, Dobby's explosion begins its final stage. There's not enough time. At this point, I'm sure Endeavor had to have thought that he was hallucinating, that maybe because of the burns, his nerves were acting and making him feel sensations that weren't there. Because in the middle of all of this chaos and him and Dobby's flames burning together into a massive blast of unholy power, he feels cold. He actually feels a chill blow across his face as he opens his eyes and sees ice, actual ice, melting and reforming and melting and reforming like a blanket over him and his son, as he turns and looks into the eyes of his wife, Rei Todoroki, whose eyes begin to steam as the skin on her face and hands begin to burn off as well. And Rei uses her quirk to delay the explosion as much as she can, trying with the little hope that she has left to freeze Toya and finally put out the fire. As the robot that she rode to get here lifts up its thumb having completed its task, and Endeavor hears his wife's screaming Toya's name as he himself questions just what she's doing here since even with her ice quirk she'll still burn to death before she's able to keep Toya from going off. However, Ray doesn't care, saying the same goes for him and Toya, right? So how could she ever leave him? Toya, hearing his mother's voice, says, Mom. As Ray apologizes to her son as he calls out to Fuyumi and Natsuo who just now arrived at this instant. Ray screams to her children to stay away, but Fuyumi tells her mom to never leave their side again, telling Toya to please stop. Please not take them away since she doesn't want to lose anyone else. And as Natsuo even chimes in yelling at Toya to stop causing trouble, the entire family uses their ice quirks all together on Toya to try and cool him down. But still, nothing. Endeavor musters all of his firepower, realizing that this isn't going to work, but still deciding that he wants to be the only one that Toya kills here. However, he can't move. It's just too much. It's just too much. At that exact moment, an orb of light forms around Dobby as rays stretch across the entire horizon stretching from it, as Dobby's flames begin to change from their blue color to a pristine, colorless white, as we see him looking at his entire family and thinking about how they're finally all looking at him. And for a second, in Dobby's mind, he sees himself with no burns, standing with his family happily in a future that never happened. And with that, Dobby's explosion begins as he thinks 
If only it was that simple. Across the battlefield, we see heroes, civilians, and even twice clones reacting to the giant rays of light coming from the expanding dome of fire stemming from Dobby's body. As everyone either starts to run, continues battling, or even just gives up in these last moments. Dobby's explosion is a sure thing, unstoppable by anyone. But off in the Philippines, we see as a woman standing at a cafe, watching the stream of everything that's happening, clutches her hands together and begins to pray for a miracle. As everything goes quiet one more time and through the streets of a small Japanese neighborhood for a split second, we see a flash of smoke that is followed a few seconds later by a massive boom. As all of the falling rain in the area is frozen in an instant and we see Tenya Ida moving at supersonic speed with a jet made of ice created around him to make him even more aerodynamic thanks to Shoto's quirk. As Shoto finally lets loose all of the phosphor energy that he's been storing so far, tearing Ida's costume that he was wearing to shreds as the pieces scatter in the wind like petals from his mother's favorite flower and Shoto leaps off of Ida's back to continue running when his friend can't run anymore. But Tenya tells Shoto that right now is the time for him to go and become the person that he always wanted to be since Ida was only able to do that because of Todoroki. One foot moves in front of the other as Todoroki closes his eyes and runs as fast as he can towards his family. And it's here where Todoroki thinks of the letter that he first wrote to his mom at the beginning of the series. The letter reads, Dear Mother, I'll try to keep this brief. I'm doing everything I can to reach my classmates level, which includes having conversations with them every day. Sometimes our conversations lead to arguments, but sometimes arguments help us understand each other's feelings. Sometimes my friends get angry and they cry, not just for themselves though, but for the sake of others. I think I want to be like that too. It's difficult, but I'll do my best. There's still so much I want to say, but I'll be seeing you soon and hopefully we can talk about all of that and more. I love you. I miss you. Your son, Shoto. As the letter comes to an end, we see Shoto finally reaching the site of his family's final battle as his eyes white out and he lets loose his final attack at the same moment that Dobby's explosion finally goes off as everything goes white. From far away, a news crew captures a massive explosion that looks like it's only beginning to spread, but in the heart of it, Shoto's Great Glacial Agar technique activates, popping the explosion itself like a bubble as Shoto completely stops the power of Dobby's combustion using the power of his Phosphor Quirk Awakening, which can dampen all sources of heat. And as the smoke clears and we see everyone reacting to the fact that they all actually get to live another day, we see Todoroki just now realizing that his entire family was there, as he says it's a good thing that they were, because even with his final technique, he doesn't think it had quite enough power to put a stop to Toya, so it truly was only with all of their efforts combined that they manage to reach this point. Shoto stands there with no energy left as his hand freezes over and the rest of his family sits there in shock, looking at their younger brother being glad that it's over. But that's the problem. It really isn't. As Dobby lays there burned to a crisp, with it not even looking like he has eyes anymore, Dobby says, Die. Perish. We should all die. But as Dobby continues to speak, he feels all the warmth in his body leaving him as it gets converted into cold because Shoto's technique means to completely disable his brother for the moment here as it begins to freeze Dobby from the inside out. Dobby is barely able to get out, I hate you dad and our family too, as he begins to pass out. But Endeavor says, Yeah, tell me everything you want to say. I want to hear it all. As he looks towards the rest of his family, apologizing to Rei for pushing her past her limit apologizing to Fuyumi for always putting everything on her shoulders, apologizing to Natsuo for always neglecting him, and apologizing to Shoto for everything. As the Todorokis one by one lay down in the snow over the burned forest of the Gunga Mountain Villa, the curtain closes on their story once and for all. 
In the end, the Todorokis were able to save Toya, also known as the villain Dobby, whose official code name was Blue Flame. Despite saving his brother and everyone else in the area, My Hero Academia has shown us that the work isn't done yet just because you were able to physically save someone. And like Eri, Dobby has a long path in front of him if he's ever meant to truly be saved. A path made much longer by the fact that Dobby doesn't seem willing to go down it, as despite everything, he still hates his family and wants nothing to do with them. However, the complicated story of his rehabilitation and the final scenes of the Todoroki family we see in the story of My Hero Academia are a story for another time. Uravity and Froppy smile once Deku is gone, knowing that the plan is starting to fix itself, sorta. However, Himiko tells the girl she's had enough and that she's ready to be who she wants to be, while caressing her pouch thinking about Twice, because if you recall, Toga actually has a vial full of Twice's blood, which was retrieved for her by Dobby. This is when, as the waves splash all around her, Toga declares that she has no need for heroes, which makes Ochaka respond that if that's the case, it must be okay if she decides to live the way that's right for her. Toga dashes forward using the waves to create gaps that she can hide behind and throw off our girls as she attempts to catch Froppy off guard, but Ochako and some other heroes are able to counter her by detecting her just in time. It's here where Ochako thinks about how Toga uses misdirection to hide her presence using some really complex technique, but there must be a limit to how many people she can evade at once given she's not literally disappearing, so they'll make sure to constantly keep watch with four people and a sensor type hero on her at all times to make sure she doesn't use any of those opportunities opportunities to just sneak away from the island and get away. Now, while things are going from every form of bad in the other areas, things are actually going really well in the Okuto Aquarium area, as we see Gang Orca shouting out that the Haya Nomu that's left doesn't have any regeneration abilities, so he calls for the most powerful heroes to join him in the battle against the beast, since most of the heroes have actually caught all of the villains that came through the portal with Toga into this area. This throws the girl off as she realizes the more villains they catch, the harder it'll be for her to hide in the middle of this battle, and the less likely of a chance she'll have to escape if things go wrong. So in her mind, she thinks that twice his blood would allow her to transform for 30 to 40 minutes, and it would fix the problem of not having a crowd to hide in. But right now, if she drinks it, she's worried that the sad man parade that she'll create will all be stuck on this island with her. And part of her goal is making sure that at least some of the twices escape out into the world so they can live some sort of life. Desperate though, she shouts out that at this rate, it's all over for her. So she has no choice but to act. In a moment before anyone can stop her or even react to what she's doing, she takes out twice his blood vial from her pouch and says she'll place all of her trust in Spinner, who's battling against Shoji in the city to try and free Kurogiri. If Spinner is able to get to Kurogiri, then she should be able to expect the portal that can take her to another area, which is part of the villain's counter strategy to Yue's plan. Froppy sees the vial in Toga's hand and in her mind, she actually doesn't realize it's supposed to be twice his blood and thinks that Toga might be drinking all for one Tomora or someone else's blood. So this makes Froppy kick it up a notch because I mean, any of those people is an instant loss for the heroes there as she expertly gets to Toga and destroys the vial before she's even able to swallow it. However, Toga reveals that it was actually a decoy that was given to her by All For One, since he figured the heroes would go all out to stop her the first time they saw her taking one of these vials, and she could use that to her advantage to create an opening. This is where we realize that it wasn't even blood inside of the vial that Froppy broke, but it was actually a drug that attracts the Nomu and makes them go wild on the target marked by it. And of course, this causes the high end that was battling Gang Orca to focus all of its attention on Froppy. The Nomu unleashes a destructive blast, and when the waves settle, Ochako sees Toga who used the blast as a cover to get some of Froppy's blood and transform into her, holding down the real one as she makes a really creepy face. And in that moment, using the distraction, she swallows the vial containing twice his blood. Immediately when this happens, everything starts to move really quickly, so let's slow it down so we can make sense of what occurs here. All right, first off, Toga transforms into Twice and immediately begins creating doubles on either side of herself that form a chain between each other like a group of friends all holding hands. At that moment, Ochako realizes that now more than ever, she's at risk of losing Himiko Toga in the chaos of everything that's happening. But then things get even worse when out of nowhere, right in front of Toga, we see a Kurogiri portal appear, giving her a way out of this battlefield and away from Ochako as Kurogiri emerges from it, saying he has to save Tamora and the others and asking her what she wishes for. Now Toga smiles and in her mind, she's thinking about how Spinner was successful and thinking about how the villains actually have a chance now with Kurogiri being free. As she tells him that she wants to exterminate the heroes, 
starting with Hawks, ordering Kurigiri to send her there immediately. Ochako tries everything she can to stop Toga from going through, even shouting that they still didn't get to talk about love, while Toga tells her that she wishes they could have, and we see her vanish through the warp gate. But Ochako is not a quitter, and here she makes a very split second decision and activates her zero gravity on her and Froppy as the two do a maneuver that makes them speed through the air, and they make it just in time to go through Kurigiri's portal as well, following Himiko Toga into the Gunga Mountain battlefield, which at this point is just beginning to devolve into madness as All For One uses Ares Rewind quirk to revive his prime body, and on top of that, Kurigiri has also opened the portal for Dobby that we know ultimately gets him here as well. Now, we've gone over some of this already. Toga comes out of the portal as twice and scares the feathers off of Hawks, who says that Toga twice should be their number one priority as he tries to deal with All For One and Endeavor focuses squarely on Dobby. But Toga just begins flooding the battlefield with twice clones at this point as they start to overwhelm all of the heroes that are there. Ochako lands saying she's never losing sight of Toga again, but Froppy takes a second to look around and realizes that the situation for the heroes here is really dire, as she sees Kurugiri and Dobby here at the same time, wondering just what happened in Todoroki and Shoji's areas to lead to events like these. As the heroes on the Gunga battlefield start to carry away the villains they've already defeated to keep them from being cremated by Dobby's flames which are spreading through the twice doubles all across the battlefield, we see Jiro and Tokoyami regrouping of Ochako and Froppy, giving them a situation report on everything that's happened in their area, and we see Jiro say that she's lucky that all she lost was an ear. Now, Chaco looks around and starts breathing heavily, saying if they don't stop Toga here, all of Japan will be buried under her sadness, but that's not really where the danger ends. We see as Toga uses her twice doubles to start making clones of characters like Shigaraki, Dobby, and All for One, sending a chill down the spines of every hero as they realize that, oh, this is over. Okay, we could just pack it up and leave. It's, we lost. There's multiple All for Ones on the battlefield. GG, folks. Because it really seems like the villains have won now that they have twice his quirk again. However, something, again, is wrong. Each and every clone of Toga's other than twice fails to use their quirks, as Toga realizes that in her mind, something is keeping her from truly loving and accepting her fellow villains, which means her ability won't let her use their quirks. Elsewhere, Ochako has a theory, saying that the real Twice's doubles could use the quirks of the people he clones, but based on Himiko's words, she can only use the quirks of the people she loves. As Ochako theorizes the reason she didn't clone the others is because she doesn't love them, but she also realizes that in this extreme situation they're in, Toga's feelings could change at any moment, so they need to find the real Himiko go as soon as possible before she has some sort of quirk evolution. Meanwhile, Himiko just hides among her Twice clones, confused, wondering why Tamora or Dobby's quirks won't work like Twice and Ochako's did, believing she loves them, yet all her attempts still failed, including her previous test before the war arc even began. Now, she assumed that when the moment comes, their powers would work in a pinch. However, the words, all heroes must die, continue to whisper and repeat through her head. And because of the confusion and the way that Ochako actually knows Toga so well, she's able to spot alone Twice, crying, recognizing that as the real Himiko, and thinking to herself how she loves seeing people happy, which is how she spotted the tears. The twice doubles start to echo what Toga is thinking that all heroes must die as they increase their swarm on the battlefield. Pixie Bob uses her earth flow quirk to try and stop them with a mass of mud and stone, but she and the other heroes are consumed by the seemingly never-ending sad man's death parade, due to Toga continuously cloning herself in a never-ending pattern. Now, while the heroes have no idea how much blood she has in stock that will allow her to keep up her transformation, they know it doesn't matter since if they don't give it all of their efforts, the first mistake will cause the Ocean of Clones to wash them all away. So Ochako starts to push through all of the clones in her way, and eventually Uravity emerges from the swarm of doubles to reach the real Toga at the top. Right at this moment, elsewhere, the final moments of Dobby's story in My Hero Academia are playing out, and realizing that she can't feel the warmth of Dobby's heat anymore burning through the nearby forest, Toga wonders what happened to him and if she just lost someone else again. Just then, Ochako uses her wire to attach to Himiko's arm, using her spacewalk ability to swing herself around to reach her, as she cries out that while they haven't shared much of each other ever since the last summer where they first met, Ochako has had a big change of heart. Toga's tears keep flowing, responding once again that it's too late for any of that. But Ochako says that she knows that she's been crying and knows the reason why she can't do the things that Twice could do. She remembers back to Froppy's theory that her love didn't extend to the 
other villains, but after seeing Toga's tears, she realizes that it's because Toga mixed in her feelings of bloodlust, so she's not working off of pure love. Himiko is shocked hearing this, to the point where part of her face is becoming exposed, yelling to Ochako about how she doesn't know the first thing about her as she slips away, and we see one of the Froppy clones starting to attack Froppy in the background, while Toga tells Ochako that she never wanted for anything because she followed every rule her parents gave her since she was born into a comfy life. But it was too much. She just wanted to be herself. She thinks about Curious's words to her again, as in her mind, she hears Curious tell her about how she pushed her feelings down, suppressed herself, and created a mask to become someone else entirely. Just then, Ochako pulls Himiko towards her, causing Toga to barely graze Froppy, but Toga has started to transform her twice clones into clones of the heroes too, so now there's a battle happening between Ochako's friends and clones of Ochako's friends, who are all attacking themselves, while during this, Toga once again manages to stab Ochako as she's trying to break free. This time, right in her chest, as this time it's actually a pretty serious wound, since Toga is right near some vital areas. But things only get worse as Toga continues to try and ignore Ochako, who begs for her to just hear her out. Froppy shouts to Toga that all this time, she was taught that following the rules is what makes someone a hero, and breaking them is what makes you into a villain. But despite this, Ochako is throwing away all the rules to try to have a conversation with her, which is something that's much tougher than her killing them all or them beating her. And she begs her to listen to what she's saying, but it still isn't enough as one final time, Toga stabs Ochako in the stomach, yelling out that they're just too different to understand each other. Because Ochako and Froppy can go on about their happy, blessed lives, but she doesn't get to feel any of that. As the rules that society has made to deal with people like her may pity her, but they don't leave room for anyone to actually care about why she ended up this way. But as this happens, she thinks back to some time in the past, where Twice asked her if she wants a villain name of her own, saying that she and Shiggy are the only ones in the League of Villains without one. Toga says that she doesn't want one, but ignoring that, we see a spinner suggest Vampress Carmilla, while Twice gives his own shot at it, suggesting that Toga goes by the name of Suck Suck or Lickitung, as Dobby calls the whole official villain name thing stupid, since it's just a custom that was never dropped before the quirk registration system was created. Shigaraki joins in explaining more about the origins of the code names for heroes and villains, but he says that he's just fine if that one, even though he thinks that they can be cool, which causes Toga to jump up in excitement at finding someone who understands her, because she thinks that the reason that she joined the League wasn't to hide her name, but to find a place where she could actually live as Himiko Toga without having to hide anything about herself from the world. We come back to the present time as through the pain, Ochako realizes that she finally has an opportunity to have Toga one on one. So she starts using her zero gravity quirk to send the two of them up and away from the battlefield as Toga screams in her face and holds a knife in Ochako's stomach down, telling her that Ochako is just trying to pity her, not understand her. And no matter what she says at the end of this, she knows that if she doesn't do what she has to do, then Ochako and the heroes are just going to throw Toga into some prison and place her on death row for everything she's done so far or has been accused of. But she says that maybe they'll do something even worse and just end her on the spot like Hawks did to Twice back during Season 6. So knowing that this is a battle for survival, Toga resolves herself to keep battling for herself and her friends as she unleashes Twice's quirk at full power and not only overpowers every villain and hero in her battlefield, but the Twice clones start to spread to a nearby city which gets buried under their swarm as one girl's emotions begin to infect the world around her for the worse. From here, she tries to finish Ochako off using even more of Twice's doubles, but Ochako, even though she's injured, is able to use Gunhead Martial Arts to knock them back and even uses her quirk to make them all float away, causing them to float back up into the air as Ochako explains that her quirk isn't meant to hurt people. And she knows that Toga has intentionally killed people, so maybe it's just her ego talking when she says that she can save Toga. However, she tells the girl that when she looks at her face, she wants to understand everything about her and why she became this way. And even more than that, she wants to save her from the world around her. She wants to create a world where Himiko Toga can exist, even if it's the most difficult path in front of her. But right now, seeing everything that's happened, it makes her truly sad. Toga tries to angrily yell back that she was always the sad one. But Ochako responds that they both were, as she explains that Toga really scared her at first when they met because she didn't understand Toga at all. And didn't understand how despite being a villain, she could put on such a wide, heart-filled smile like she always does when she's being herself. In that moment, as Toga tries to tell her to shut up and die, she's haunted by a vision of herself twisted into the monster that everyone sees her as, as she realizes that Ochako just complimented her smile. After a life of everyone, even Toga's parents, telling her that they couldn't stand the sight of that creepy demon smile. Taking advantage of Toga's hesitation, Ochako says she's already pushed Toga away before, but she's seen so many smiling faces in the crowd when heroes save people that she was blown away when she saw Toga smile and actually started to feel jealous of how perfect it was. Hearing this, Toga starts to cry even more as Ochako places one of her hands on the swarm of Twice clones when suddenly the entire swarm splits open as the Twice clones in the 
heroes begin to float through the air, thanks to Ochako's brand new quirk awakening, which much like Shigaraki's allows her quirk to spread through everything that's touching what she initially touched. So now her zero gravity can spread through every individual twice clone and hero that are all pressed up against each other, completely taking them out of the fight as they all float up towards the sky and have to stop battling. Finally, Ochako rushes towards Toga, telling her that she can't erase her crimes or approve of anything that she's done, but if she still feels like talking, she can have a lifetime's worth of blood, begging her to have one last chat about romance, but she's still too far away from Toga to actually reach her, and her body is starting to go cold from all the injuries she's taken and the blood loss. As she starts screaming, Ochako shouts that her parents are poor, so she became a hero to put a smile on their faces, and over time she became an excellent hero who fell in love with Izuku Midoriya, and now only wants to stop Himiko Toga and save her before it's too late. And that's who she is and why she's here. As Ochako uses her grappling hook to attach to Toga once more and gets close to her, but Toga is still not willing to listen. Slashing at Ochako a few more times while her hero begs her to tell her everything that's on her mind and all of her thoughts and feelings. In one last fit of rage over how nothing is going the way that she planned, Toga is about to crash down on Ochako with one final life-ending stab, but at that last moment, she stops and just begins to cry and cry and cry. When she speaks, she tells Ochako that she falls in love easily. Whether it's animals, villains, heroes, boys, or girls, they all have amazing blood pumping through them. She says all her life, she was told not to smile, and she gets so jealous of others who got to be happy with who they were. She says Izuku reminds her of a boy she used to like named Saito, but knew she couldn't ask him for his blood because then he'd call her a freak and not cute at all. That just like Ochako and Izuku, everyone would scold her and lecture her on the right way to be, which is why she joined the League of Villains because then she could live and love how she needed to. Ochako, finally getting Toga to open up a bit to the point where she starts to understand her, says that the signs were always there from Toga, but it took Ochako so long to notice what she really needed was just a friend who would accept her. And hearing this, Toga begins to feel twice his transformation start to fade off of her body, meaning that his blood has been used up, and it'll be gone soon. As the heroes start to notice all the doubles disappearing around them, Ochako tells Toga she also thinks that there's something amazing about someone who's all injured and destroyed, but is still trying their hardest anyway. And she continues on to say that she knows that she can never be a replacement for the League, but she still wants Toga to know how special she thinks her smile is. Toga's black heart begins to melt away and reveal the peaceful girl lost inside the darkness once again. As Toga asks if she really is cute, and Ochako responds, the cutest girl in the world causing Toga to smile one more time as her tears continue to fall and all the doubles fade away into the sky. However, things aren't over yet as Ochako is barely able to feel her body at all when her and Toga reach the ground. She's lost way too much blood and starts to realize that this is it. Even though she won, she won't be able to make it back to her class or to her parents or to Deku. But hopefully, her friends will see what she did here and carry on her wishes for what should happen to Toga, since she won't be here to see it. And that's when Toga arrives in front of Ochako, realizing exactly what she needs to do, as we see Toga grabbing her blood-sucking villain gear, as at that same time she becomes Ochako using the small bit of blood that she got from the beginning of the battle to give Ochako a blood transfusion using her clone's blood, which should save Ochako's life, just like Twice was able to do to Toga during My Villain Academia. Ochako cries, pleads, fights even, telling Toga to stop, telling her that it's okay, she got what she wanted and did all of this so that Toga could live. But Toga once again repeats that no matter how good Ochako means, she knows after all of this, she'll still have to end up in prison, and life is going to be extremely hard. But now that she knows someone could understand her and truly love her, that someone could accept her, especially someone like Ochako who everyone loves including Toga, then she can be happy with giving her life and doing one good deed to make sure that person gets to continue to exist. Because no matter how sad a world without Toga might be for Ochako, a world of Auto Chaco is just something that shouldn't be allowed to exist to Toga. So in this moment, Toga sets her machine to literally give all of her blood over to Ochako in a constant blood transfusion, hoping that someone is going to actually make it there to Ochako to seal those wounds and, and make sure her body doesn't get completely filled with blood. So in that moment, giving Ochako an emergency blood infusion where Toga intends to actually use pretty much all the remaining blood that is left in her body to save Ochako, leaving nothing left for herself, the two girls cry holding each other as the battle at the Okuto Aquarium on Okuto Island, Japan, draws to a close. Somewhere in her mind, as Toga is fading away off of this world, 
we see as a perfectly healed Himiko Togo with a smile on her face walks to the edge of a cliff and watches a small sparrow fly away into the freedom of the open sky. As Toga says, in the end, her life wasn't a mistake, and she isn't sad that she got to live it because in the end, someone told her that she was beautiful, and she finally got to experience true love as Himiko Toga dies. On the Gunga Mountain battlefield, on the heels of Todoroki's victory against his brother Dabi, we saw as Endeavor risked his life and limb to reach all for one in time for a devastating attack, meant to save Hawks, Jiro, and Tokoyami, who the mastermind was looking to kill with his next attack. But ultimately, Endeavor's goal with this final attack was to end this side of the war all at once, as in this moment, he used every bit of firepower he thought that he had left. And when the smoke clears, he sees all for one's body floating in the air, beginning to fall towards the ground, as Endeavor thinks to himself that he's actually actually done it, since according to their intel, All For One doesn't actually have any of the same regeneration quirks that Shigaraki has, something that likely happened as a result of All For One realizing that it would be more beneficial for Shigaraki himself to pretty much have all of the healing quirks placed into his body, because the villain had a trick left to play up his sleeves that it was now time for the heroes to witness. As Endeavor lets his guard down for a moment to take a breather, knowing that he can rest easy, Hawk screams his name to warn him that things aren't over yet, as Endeavor slowly lifts his barely held up head to to look up towards All For One, whose body has stopped falling towards the ground, and now floats completely charred and burned beyond repair in front of them. As the Demon Lord begins to speak and Endeavor realizes that this fight is long from over, All For One says, Do you really believe that I would step onto this stage without an ace up my sleeve? You should know by now this body is well past its expiration date. I no longer have any use for it, but that's why there's something I'd like to try. An experiment, if you will. Sparks of energy begin to emanate from All For One's body, tearing across his charred flesh, as in his head he thinks of exactly where he got this power, as All For One sees a vision of Aerie and one of Overhaul's quirk erasing bullets, and it's revealed that he's not only stolen a version of her quirk for himself, but now in this moment against the number one hero where everyone is already exhausted, All For One begins to heal all the way back to his prime body he had when he fought against All Might, using Aerie's rewind with a massive smile on his face. As the Demon Lord laughs at Endeavor and the others, we see his eyes and his ears begin to heal back first, as All For One's rewind energy creates flesh and skin all over his body, and he tells the heroes that they were wrong for thinking that the heroes were the only ones prepared to risk their lives, as this very risky play by All For One seems to work out in his favor, but soon we'll explain the major problem with this tactic. So when All For One begins rewinding, we cut to Deku for a moment as he's flying back to Shigaraki's area to try and help out Bakugo and the others who are all being torn apart as we speak. Yoichi, the first one for all user, appears behind Deku in a cloud of vestige smoke, telling him that something is wrong and he has a really bad feeling about this war. However, it's at that moment that Deku was approached by Star and Stripe squad of pilots as they offered Deku a faster way to get back to UA. Now, before we cut back to Gunga Mountain Villa, we see a flashback of All For One's first act after breaking out of prison, which was to go to a secret underground base that he shared with the Doctor. And despite the fact that by this point, the Doctor was already arrested during the events of Season 6's war arc, we hear an audio recording that he leaves behind for All For One that explains to him that as soon as Shigaraki retrieved the quirk erasing bullets, the doctor started to work on trying to figure out how they were made and more importantly, how they work. And during that process, he discovered two things. The first being that like we, the audience know, the effects of the bullets stem from someone's quirk, which is really fascinating to the doctor. But more interestingly, he also discovered that the effect of the quirk itself was to reverse causality, which more or less means that Ares quirk can target any specific aspect of something and reverse it, and a good example would be on a person. Let's say Aerie mastered her quirk and used it on a human being. In that case, she would be able to do many different things. For example, she'd be able to rewind a person's age until they were literally rewinded out of existence. But if she decided to, instead of rewinding their actual age, she could rewind their DNA to turn that human being into a monkey or any other stage of our evolutionary process. In a similar manner, her quirk is able to rewind specifically the quirk factor of a human being, but it would probably take a whole different video to explain how weird things get when you consider that Aerie can rewind her rewinds, which essentially enables her to fast forward targets as well. This is a truly horrifying quirk that suddenly mutated in this girl, and Dr. Garaki notes this as he tells All For One that during his studies, he practically only focused on the quirk itself and reproducing its effects, and while he was definitely able to as he created a version of the quirk that All For One could take, it comes with the caveat of being something that can only be done once, since once All For One activates Aerie's quirk, it will never deactivate. 
Perhaps if the doctor was given more time and years of study to figure out a perfected version, then the evil Lord would have never had to stoop to such a desperate strategy. But as All For One puts on his new mask and hears the doctor's final goodbyes, we cut back to the present where we see All For One in all of his glory, finally showing his face in our story as all of his injuries rewind themselves and the first thing on his mind is giving Endeavor praise for actually pushing him this far. All For One falls out of the sky down towards the battlefield where many heroes are fighting against Nomu and villains in all out wars. However, as he comments that his body feels as light as a feather, he speed blitzes through a group of four heroes and takes an article of clothing from each of them as he grabs a woman by the neck and steals her quirk as well. Hawk sweeps in and saves her from All For One before he's actually able to kill her and the villain stands there looking sort of sad for a moment as he says that now that he's used his trump card, he'll eventually disappear and die, but like a baton, his dream has been passed on to Shigaraki. So right now, he wants the heroes to allow him to fulfill the last remaining task of a dying king, which is to rescue the Dark Prince from the trap the heroes have sprung on them. Hawks tries to buy time for Endeavor to heal by asking All For One questions about One For All, as All For One explains that all he's ever wanted was to obstruct the future of the world and become the enemy of progress, because only through that action can he ever truly be considered humanity's greatest villain. Now, over in America, we see that the situation has gotten really grim, as people hide in shelters, much like in Japan, and villains run wild in the streets, because America seems to have faced the same problem that Japan did, with All For One's lackeys coming out and destabilizing society, likely by doing their own prison breaks of quirk powered individuals that basically made it unsafe to come outside or even stay in your homes during this period. We can see signs that say we are all for one, not too far from the White House, as inside, the president explains to Timothy Agpar that America is going to abandon Japan completely and side with all for one when this war is over. And it's gotten to the point where American intelligence is stating that every country around the world is preparing to do the same, so the president wants to be the first to do this since they might have already incurred his wrath due to Star and Stripe's attack on Shigaraki and their use of nukes near the ocean of Japan to try and put him down. Every nation scrambles to gain Shigaraki's trust, but Agpar argues that this is the time to stand strong, because if not, when the dust settles, even if they try to bow their heads, they'll be robbed of everything they have. However, as this discussion rages on, a lot of things happen all at once at the Gunga Mountain battlefield, as we've previously explained that things reach a point where the battlefield is swarmed with twice clones, as Dobby arrives to take care of his father Endeavor, and Alchako and Toga do battle amidst the horde of twices that are completely storming the entire battlefield. With all of this going on, this more or less leaves All For One completely free to fly towards Shigaraki's area. However, making him his priority, we see as Hawks with his remaining feathers tries to keep up with the Demon King, who thinks to himself that he just needs to reach Shigaraki and force his own All For One quirk onto him for him to take over Shigaraki's body and completely lock away the Tenko Shimura personality forever. Hawks screams that this war is the story of how the heroes came out on top, so he'll never let All For One get away. But as Tokoyami spots his teacher in the distance as Hawks sends a high-speed slash towards All For One with his vibrating sword, we see All For One narrowly dodge this before letting loose a quirk on Hawks that completely scatters his body across the sky, as red feathers and blood litter the forest outside of the Gunga Mountain Villa, and Hawks, the number two hero, dies. Seeing what happened to his teacher, Tokoyami screams as tears fill his eyes and a rage begins to fill the deepest parts of his stomach. However, before he snaps and loses control, Suddenly, Hawks' red feathers that were floating in the air around his body begin to turn into red roses as his blood itself turn into petals and in the air in front of All For One and Tokoyami, a shoujo manga version of Hawks' head floats still, completely shocking everyone and causing this amazing reaction from Tokoyami as it's revealed that not only was the Hawks that All For One destroyed an illusion, but that illusion came at the hands of Shiketsu High's number one airhead, Kami, as the Shiketsu students arrive on the battlefield and All For One has an entire new threat to try and handle. You see, in our last part about this battlefield, we discussed how Jiro and Tokoyami actually managed to give All For One a little trouble. However, now with him in his prime form, obviously it's going to take a little more than just these two first year UA students to stand up against someone that fought All Might. Thankfully for the heroes, the students over at Shiketsu actually have some pretty broken abilities, with Kami's illusions being so realistic that even All For One can't see through them. But more importantly, coming in like a raging hurricane, we see Inasa finally making his appearance in this final arc as he summons giant whiplashes of wind that scoop up nearly all of the Twice clones in the area, while his friend Meatball uses his quirk to turn the Twices into useless lumps of meat that can't do anything, as this trio sets their eyes on All For One. On the battlefield, every hero 
Shiro, who was fighting against Twice clones, as well as every Shiketsu student who is now on the battlefield, target their long range attacks towards All for One all at once. But the Evil Lord more or less dodges everything really easily, except for a few attacks that he has to use a Twice clone as a human shield for. All for One puts a really big smile on his face as he realizes that the heroes are now willing to risk it all to bring an end to this battle and keep him from leaving the Gunga Mountain Villa. So he spreads his arms apart and summons a massive ball of energy with crackling lightning all around it, sending many of the heroes flying and injuring plenty of others, but still waves and waves of heroes stay strong and fire their attacks at All for One, who was busy describing why they should all be so afraid of him. At this time, we see him actually get swept up in one of Inasa's attacks, as All for One is really put in a dangerous situation, since inside of the wind cage that Inasa has created for him, there are plenty of projectiles and more importantly parts of Meatball's quirk that would instantly defeat All for One if he touched even a single one. The villain thinks to himself that this is actually a really smart tactic as he plans on sealing Inasa's quirk and leaving, which leads to him causing a massive energy explosion with him at the center as a bolt of lightning from his attack even flies into the Shiketsu student's face, blasting off his hat and part of his head, but nothing can stop Inasa from pushing himself to his absolute limit as Hawks notes that one for all isn't the only thing that links people's hearts together, and that maybe Endeavor and all of the other heroes have forged their own fair share of links that together could actually gain them victory on this day. As All for One looks down at Hawks and sees the light of hope still in his eyes and thinks to himself that they still aren't taking him seriously. But it's at this moment where things finally start to get serious, as suddenly while floating in the air, All for One feels an extremely dangerous presence behind him as we see a massive version of Dark Shadow lingering behind the Demon King, and Tokoyami looking down on All for One, telling him that nobody ever crowned him the King of Shadows, so he'll be taking all of All for One's darkness to use it for himself and claim that title for the heroes. As Dark Shadow continues to grow and stands up, destroying a massive section of the forest around him, thanks to the dark clouds and the lack of Dabi's flames currently present due to the storm that has rolled in over the course of this battle. Tokoyami then reveals to All for One a secret strategy that the heroes had this whole time, which was based on a statement by All Might a long time ago, where the hero said that All for One has to make physical contact with a quirk user to steal their quirk, because it's not like he could just touch Endeavor's fire and steal it that way, which gave rise to the idea that Tokoyami himself might be an excellent counter or at least capable of helping Hawks and Endeavor in this fight. Since All for One can't steal his quirk just by touching Dark Shadow. So in this moment, with All for One actually scared for the first time in a long time, we see Inasa use his quirk to pull All for One closer to Giant Dark Shadow's massive punch as the creature slams down on All for One with a devastating impact. As Tokoyami forces his hand down onto All for One, trying to crush him or at least do as much damage as he could, Hawks informs him that he's invincible right now, but he's on a timer. So they need to keep the pressure up as much as possible as they all start creating plans about what they're about to do. But all those plans fall apart when another massive bright explosion erupts right next to Dark Shadow, completely bathing him in his only weakness as All for One emerges from out beneath his fist, looking noticeably younger than he was before taking Tokoyami's punches, showing just how much damage they did as All for One's rewind needed to speed up and use a large amount of its remaining energy just to keep him alive. Now, while this may be a momentary win for the heroes, with Dark Shadow at least out of the picture for now, this leaves a now younger and even more powerful powerful version of All for One to start rampaging across the battlefield, as at full speed he not only tried to fly away, but also unleashed a storm of lightning across the entire landscape to take out any heroes that he flew past. At that time, something would happen that would cause both sides to think this is perfect timing, as off in the distance while Hawks, Tokoyami, and Inasa are all chasing All for One through the skies, the Demon Lord spots Gigantomachia, as he sighs a sigh of relief, knowing that his pet giant can now handle the rest of these heroes and finally give him the break that he needs. So imagine All for One's confusion when he watches Gigantomachia grab an entire mountain and throw it directly at him at full force, an attack which he barely manages to avoid by destroying the mountain using one of his quirks as he uses another one to zoom in on Gigantomachia as he spots Kirishima, Shino, and Mina on top of Makia's head and truly starts to wonder just what the hell is going on in this final battle. Makia sends another mountain top his way as All for One sends an attack towards the heroes on his head to knock some sense into the beast and free him from Shinto's control. But we actually find out that Makia isn't being controlled here as he feels betrayed by All for 
for one abandoning him and clearly using him for all these years without any intention of ever coming back for him. Something which broke Makia's heart because he's always been the most loyal to All for One and never once disobeyed him or his orders. Now, this of course means that there's no way for All for One to stop Makia's attacks against him right now because the beast actually wants to take him down. And as Mount Lady finally rejoins the battle using a massive rocket warhammer, Dark Shadow has finally completely reformed as he along with the other two kaijus all smash down attacks on All for One at once, trapping the villain again under their blows. All over the world, people watch live streams of the different battles happening all across Japan. However, as the heroes and Makia continue to bash All for One into the earth, when Mount Lady's weapon breaks and she takes just a second to switch to another support item that Yui Kodai from Class 1B makes giant for her, All for One uses that moment to send two giant mouths out of the ground as one tears through her torso and sends her flying up into the air, shifting back into her normal size as she's completely knocked out or maybe even worse from the force of this blow. Things get worse as beneath Makia, the earth starts to crumble and crack as it glows a bright purple and a stream of energy erupts from it, rushing straight up into the air like a giant rope of crackling energy that tears through Giganto Makia and sends him falling towards the ground, also completely out of commission. And it's at that point where we watch all for one who had been beaten down to the bone start to regenerate as he screams to Makia that he's a fool who deserves to die and thinks to himself that something dark is building up inside him because he can feel that the younger that he gets the harder it is to control his homicidal urges this causes all for one to create a ball of electricity in his hands that he fires off causing his entire arm to blow away but this orb of lightning makes direct contact with dark shadow and completely obliterates it with hawks and tokoyami inside shredding the two heroes to pieces as they're flung towards the ground beneath them barely still in one piece everyone looks on in horror as all for one explains that they never had a chance against him because he can draw out the full potential of every quirk he uses but inasa yells to the other heroes that it isn't too late and all they need to do is attack but this is when everything goes black and it all goes quiet on the battlefield for a moment as a strike of lightning flashes, we return to the Gunga Mountain battlefield and see a scene straight out of a horror book, with heroes impaled on spikes across the battlefield and blood literally everywhere. As Tokoyami lays on the ground completely knocked out, we watch as All for One holds Hawks by the neck, telling him that he pushed the Demon Lord too far. And now All for One is going to take Tokoyami's quirk and become truly unstoppable. But Hawks, who is barely conscious, stabs his sword through All For One's heart, as All For One tells Hawks, enough, you've already tried your best. Even with your quirk in such a pitiful state, you managed to put up an amazing fight. I'm honestly impressed. As Hawks' sword starts to get pushed out of All For One's body thanks to the rewind healing, we see as All For One steals Hawks' quirk and grows a set of his very own wings, albeit still very small and unable to completely grow because of Ares' rewind. But as All For One thinks to himself that rewind is still speeding up in response to every injury that he takes, he feels something wet hit the back of his leg as he turns around making a face that screams, Really? And he spots Mineta laying on the floor, having just hit him with one of his great balls. And the boy tells him not to steal Tokoyami's quirk because it'll turn him into a complete edgelord. So instead, he should take Mineta's quirk and get the best hairstyle in the world. But really, Mineta says that he can take any quirk he wants, but please... Don't take Dark Shadow away from Tokoyami, as he stares down all for one with his eyes full of rage for his friend and fear for himself. In this moment, all for one looks down towards the ground and sees his body continuing to rewind, and for a moment he remembers how Jiro's screams cause his quirks to act up, thinking that there may be some sort of latent danger in hearing the screams of the weak. So realizing that he doesn't have much time left, he throws Hawks to the side and flies straight up into the air, telling the heroes that the news cameras are there and they've been watching everything, and that at the end of the day, they weren't able to protect anything, which will lead to the entire world being disappointed in them, just as he'd planned. And from here, All For One flies away towards Shigaraki's area to begin the final battle of the series, as officially, the battle at the Gunga Mountain Villa against All For One ends, and the winner is All For One. 
Now, in the aftermath, all of our heroes lay down as the cold rain falls on top of them. However, Hawks thinks to himself that there's still hope, no matter how desperate things may look as he sits next to Tokoyami and places his hand on his student, happy that Tokoyami didn't meet the same fate as him and having his quirk taken. While elsewhere, we see All for One flying into the city that UA is currently floating the closest to, as he thinks to himself that he's really calling it close here with Ares Rewind, but below him, he spots all Might, standing in the middle of the road, screaming towards the villain and saying, I am here, as All for One's dark urges resurface again, and despite the fact that he's really desperate for time here, he can't stop himself from flying towards All Might and beginning an entirely new battle. As All Might's briefcase transforms around him, and our hero All Might returns to the battlefield with a powered up suit that actually makes him a threat in this battle. But before we discuss their final fight, we need to discuss the mutant uprising in My Hero Academia and the fate of the one who might be the most important to the League of Villains plans in this final battle, Kurogiri. Thanks for listening to this story, and as a reminder, this is part 8 in a long series of videos explaining everything that happened in My Hero Academia Season 7. We're almost finished now with just three parts left before we're finished, and the plan is to finish right before the season comes out, so next month you'll likely see two of these videos at some point, and that's all possible because of you, since at least one of those is going to be done by an editor thanks to the money made from your help. So please subscribe, hit that like button, or even share the video, and it'll make sure you get these videos a little quicker in the future. I appreciate you guys. Check out my new horror channel, Very Scary Pineapple, where we've already covered a few scary stories and we even have shorts if you're not into long form content but i've rambled long enough so i'll see you later it's pineapple peace